Nikki McCown Marilyn Renee McCown, known as Nikki, disappeared on July 22, 2001, in Richmond, Indiana. When she vanished, Nikki was 28 years old and the mother of a 9-year-old girl. She was also engaged to Bobby Webster and worked as a prison guard and was one of 10 children stemming from a close and loving family. Three weeks before her wedding day, she visited her mother. Nikki was allegedly distraught over being harassed by two men at a laundromat. The men frightened her to the degree she was unable to retrieve her laundry but eventually left to pick it up. And just like that, she disappeared. Authorities claim there were no traces of foul play or a clear motive for her disappearance. On the day of her vanishing, her fiancé Bobby was at a tuxedo shop with his best man with the intent of meeting with Nikki later that day to spend quality time together. Her family worked closely with the police to theorize the reasons for her disappearance. The first theory was that she was kidnapped by the two men who accosted her that day. However, they were never identified or found. The second suspect was Bobby due to his strange behavior following her disappearance. He cancelled their wedding instead of postponing it. Secondly, he asked for her community college tuition back and was angered upon the discovery it was paid by for her workplace. Thirdly, Bobby attempted to return his wedding ring, but could not because it was bought under Nikki's name. According to him, it was out of a desire to obtain the necessary funds to continue searching for her and to purchase a mobile phone, which at the time was still a luxury item. Bobby was tested using a polygraph test. He allegedly failed, but his lawyer argues he was not permitted to see the results. Her car was found three months later outside of an apartment in Ohio in Dayton which was a 45-minute drive from her Richmond home. The police found evidence that the car had been meddled with, a broken door lock and stolen stereo, but without a trace of fingerprints or DNA for potential suspects. Nikki's laundry was still within the car, meaning she safely left the laundromat. Nikki's ex lived in the apartment where her car was found, but had a solid alibi of working the day she vanished and is believed by the police to be uninvolved in the case due to a successful polygraph test. Nikki had a co-worker in Dayton and could have driven to them after picking up her laundry. A prominent theory suggests the guilty party drove the car to the apartment to conceal their involvement. This theory strengthened Bobby as the main suspect despite his claims of innocence. Finally, Tommy Swint, her co-worker, was a third suspect, a security guard and corrections officer. Swint attempted to join the police force but was made to resign due to being a suspect in the case. In 2007, the police were contacted and told to investigate Swint via Tina Ivory, who at the time was a Dayton prostitute, but her life was taken from her in 1991 and who Swint supposedly dated. Nikki's sister revealed in 2008 that Swint and Nikki had an affair. In the same year, the blood and semen on Tina were matched with Swint's DNA. Swint took his life before he could be prosecuted. He is now considered the prime suspect not only in Nikki's case, but in multiple others. But this case is to forever remain unsolved, given Swint is deceased and unable to testify or be charged. Her body was never found, and she's still officially reported as missing. Rachel Cook Rachel Louise Cook was last seen in Georgetown, Texas on the 10th of January 2002. She was a 19-year-old student of Mesa Junior College. Rachel was spending winter break at her parents' house when she disappeared. She allegedly went on a morning run from which she never returned. Investigators claim she likely left her home at 9.30 a.m. She was spotted by her neighbors at 11 a.m. 200 yards from her house, but Rachel never made it home. When her father, Robert, arrived home at 3 p.m. to take his daughter shopping, she was nowhere to be found. Her family started a wide-scale search for her, but not a single clue or trace of her was ever discovered to allude to her whereabouts. A car with white and black stripes along the hood was seen riding around Rachel's neighborhood on the tragic day, but revealed no outward suspects. In 2006, Michael Keith Moore, an inmate, confessed to taking the life of Rachel Cook whilst already convicted for taking the life of someone else. Moore declared he kidnapped her and hit her using a hammer, then dropped her remains into the Gulf of Mexico. Despite his accurate confession, 
The charges were dropped when Moore confessed to lying about what happened before he was set to plead guilty. The case reopened in 2017 when someone tipped the authorities about traces of a buried body in a field, thinking it might belong to her, but they found nothing from the investigation. The following year, the police announced they found a car matching the description of the one seen riding in her neighborhood the day of her disappearance, a Pontiac Trans. The car was found in Dallas. The car was analyzed with the hopes of finding DNA samples. The analysis of the trunk of the car revealed the possible presence of blood. A search was conducted in December 2020, but its results are unknown. As recently as January 2021, authorities publicly stated they were searching for a man who they believe has intel about her disappearance who lived in Georgetown in 2002 and knew Rachel. It's thought this man was part of the cattle industry and that he possesses details which might help the case. It's thought he is attempting to distance himself from the case, but allegedly this individual mentioned specific details of the disappearance to his friend, which put the police on edge. Unfortunately, in 2014, Rachel's father passed away, never knowing what became of his daughter. There is a $100,000 reward for those who are able to assist in the solving of the case or who possess valuable information regarding it. Now, 20 years later, it's unlikely that the mystery will ever be solved, but hope continues. Authorities doubt Rachel is still alive, but if she is, that would make her 39 years old. Throughout these two decades, the family and county sheriff's office have tracked down a myriad of fruitless anonymous tips. Rachel's mother holds out faith for the truth, having stated, Somebody out there knows something. There is no doubt in my mind. It's just a matter of them knowing they need to come forward with that information. As a child, Rachel put her handprint on the wooden panel in her home. All three of my children put their little handprints and wrote their name. Rachel did a happy face with a freckle. This, along with photographs and souvenirs, are all a mother has left of her daughter. The Disappearance of Angela Freeman Mama, I love you. I'll see you Friday. Those were the last words that Deborah Freeman ever heard from her daughter. Soon after, the 17-year-old named Angela Freeman told her mother that she was going to spend Thursday night with her friend. However, two days later, the 1984 Honda Accord car that she had just handed her mother a cash payment for was found abandoned near a bridge in Missouri. Angela was nowhere to be found. To make matters even worse, she was four months pregnant at the time. In the beginning, authorities simply shrugged it off as a missing persons case. Even though mobile phones did not exist back then, missing teenagers were bound to show up within a day or two. Yet, that was not the case for Angela. Instead of finding her daughter safe and sound, Deborah found blood on the car instead. In fear, they instantly notified the police. It turns out that what was dismissed as merely transmission fluid, after this, blood was confirmed to be found next to her car. After numerous diver and cadaver dog searches around the area, all that was discovered were her shoes found in two separate areas. Suddenly, this case transformed from a disappearance to a homicide. No one could sit around and wait for her to show any longer. The detectives revealed that Angela was last seen outside of an old pizza hut at around 1am on a Friday. Her whereabouts after she'd left couldn't be traced. They suspected that a man who was seen washing his car and hunting near the bridge area was involved, but they did not have enough evidence to confirm anything. No matter how desperate everyone was to find Angela, it seemed that all hope was lost. It has been decades since she said goodbye to her mother on that fateful day of September 8, 1993. Even though Angela herself was so excited to be a mother, she would never be able to realize that dream. However, people like police captain Rusty Keyes have still not given up. In due time, Angela Freeman's disappearance might no longer stay a mystery. The Disappearance of Maurice Gordon Doc Dametz Maurice Gordon Doc Dametz was an 84-year-old Christian reverend of whom had a relatively successful writing career during his time working as a Christian leader of his small community with a number of successful publications under his belt, such as his works titled Focal Points of Christian History, Trouble Transformed, Burden Bearing, Mystery of Godliness, and Dead at the Top. 
Unfortunately, Dr. Metz was suffering from a severe blood disorder that made it difficult for him to be alone and had severe arthritis complications that prevented him from being able to move without assistance. Despite these physical limitations, Dr. Metz enjoyed spending his free time venturing out into the wilderness to locate ideal locations for mining precious gems and minerals. De Metz had been a fan of leading his own private expeditions in the field of geology and would often invite a close friend of his to accompany him when making trips out into the national parks or empty stretches of wilderness to assist him during the trip and help him move throughout different pieces of rugged terrain. Doc's fascination for the field of geology would eventually lead him to joining the American Federation of Mineral Societies and Flatiron Gem and Mineral Club, becoming an experienced veteran of private expeditions and mining efforts. It is for all these reasons that it came as a shock to the wife of Dr. Metz when Doc disappeared suddenly and unexpectedly when venturing out into the Pike National Forest located in the front range of Colorado, when taking a trip with his close friend McSherry to find a digging spot for minerals. According to McSherry, the two had found a small sandy pit close to the Rampart Range Road, where McSherry said he had left de Metz to venture out an extra 50 yards to find his own sandy pit to dig from. After about two hours of mining, McSherry returned to Dr. Metz and told him they would be driving home soon because it would be getting dark. Doc had said that he would be gathering his tools while McSherry returned to his pit to pack up his things. After McSherry finished packing his things, he returned to Dr. Metz's pit only to find that he had completely disappeared without a trace. When investigations were made, detectives remarked that the disappearance of Dr. Metz seemed perplexing as there was no evidence of a struggle or any footsteps, markings or tracks left behind in any direction. Additionally, all of Dr. Metz's tools went missing with him, with nothing left in the pit to be used as evidence. On the 18th of July 1981, the wife of Maurice Gordon Dr. Metz wrote a letter to her governor, Governor Richard Lamb, asking for any assistance in helping her find her husband. The letter detailed that she believed some form of conspiracy had been committed against her husband, with thoughts that he had met some form of foul play or had been carried away, but that all efforts for an investigation were being impeded by unseen forces. Despite this letter, no further action was taken, with Dr. Metz declared dead in 1990. The Disappearance of Margaret Ellen Fox Whilst some people tucked out of sight are indeed fugitives, the next case is more likely to pull at your heartstrings as we look into the disappearance of Margaret Ellen Fox, a young girl who was last seen when she was just 14. It was 1974 in Burlington, New Jersey, when Margaret disappeared. Like many young teen girls, she was on her way to a babysitting job, though unfortunately for Margaret, things took an unexpected turn for the worst. The young girl was on her way to meet a man who had named himself as John Marshall. Margaret had placed an ad for her babysitting services, which is how she had met the so-called John Marshall. Marshall had said he needed a babysitter for the coming weekend, but had delayed or otherwise cancelled several initial meetings with her. When she eventually had plans to meet with the man, he had said that he would meet her in a red Volkswagen in Mount Holly. Young Miss Fox walked beside her sister to the bus stop to make her way to Mount Holly. Her sister watched her get onto the bus, and witnesses have reported having seen her near the high streets once she reached Mount Holly, though she has not been seen since these few sightings. Did she even make it to the alleged John Marshall? We do know that not long after Margaret had been reported to be missing, the police had begun to track and record all calls both in and out of the family home in order to keep tabs on any new leads or necessary information. It was a good job they did as the family did receive a ransom call, demanding $10,000 for Margaret's safe return. The call went as follows. 10000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. It was Margaret's mother who was on the other end of this harrowing phone call. Years later, we still don't know who made this call. It's assumed that the unknown caller and the abductor is one of the same, though they had no clues as to who this may be. The investigation surrounding this disappearance only continued to raise further questions. The number Marshall had given to Margaret turned out to belong to a Lumberton supermarket. 
This, of course, immediately raised suspicion amongst the authorities. After this, several other parents came forward saying their young teen daughters had had men trying to lure them with false job offers. To this day, the identity of John Marshall remains a mystery. With no further leads and years of efforts, the FBI and Burlington City Police Department have shifted their approach. Despite the lack of arrests, the department has not given up all hope. You can find the recording of the ransom call on the FBI website, uploaded in the hope that someone will recognize the voice of the abductor. Deep within the heart of the Congo rainforest, where the lush canopy blocks out the sun's rays, allegedly lives a creature of legend and myth, the Jabarfofi spider. Stories of its colossal size and formidable presence echoed through the tales of indigenous tribes and intrigued explorers seeking adventure. One man who describes himself as an explorer recently said that he had journeyed to the Congo rainforest in search of rare flora and fauna, hoping to uncover the secrets of this untamed wilderness. Armed with a backpack and camera, he ventured into the jungle, accompanied only by his trusty guide, Nkosi. Thomas and Nkosi spent several days traversing through the dense undergrowth. They heard the chorus of birds and insects, caught glimpses of fleeting wildlife, and marveled at the emerald beauty surrounding them. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth, and a symphony of nocturnal creatures began to sing their serenades. The following day, as they pushed through a particularly dense thicket, they stumbled upon a vast clearing, and above them was an expansive web stretched out before them. In the center of the colossal web sat a huge spider. Thomas said that he'd never seen a spider this big before and proceeded to take photographs. However, due to how high up the spider was, he said that it was difficult to capture. He also pointed out that there was webbing around the creature, but noted that it doesn't show up in the photos. Thomas then said that Nkosi warned him about this creature, telling him to be cautious, as this spider is venomous. Nkosi told Thomas to back away, sensing that the creature's patience was wearing thin. Natives who live in these regions consider the spider to be the jungle's guardian, and said that it had allowed them a glimpse into its world, but that the time had come for them to leave. As the two explorers retreated from the clearing, Thomas couldn't wait to share his finding, and said that he now feels a newfound appreciation for the rainforest and its mysteries. In the days that followed, Thomas said that they didn't encounter another one of these spiders, but said that due to the experience it's given him a newfound respect for the natural world. Interestingly, this isn't the first time that this creature has allegedly been encountered. The Congo rainforest, one of the most biologically diverse regions on Earth, is steeped in ancient legends and mythical creatures. Among these tales, the legend of the Jabafofi spider stands out, capturing the imagination of the indigenous peoples of the Congo for generations. The legend of the Jabafofi spider has its roots in the oral traditions of the indigenous peoples of the Congo region. The term Jabafofi translates to giant spider in the local dialect, reflecting the awe and fear the creature inspires. These tales describe a colossal arachnid that surpasses the size of any known spider species, with some accounts claiming it spans several meters in diameter. In the rich tapestry of Congolese folklore, the spider is often depicted as a guardian of the jungle, inhabiting the deepest and most remote corners of the rainforest. Its presence is believed to be both a symbol of protection and a harbinger of danger, making it an integral part of the cultural fabric of the local communities. Although the spider has captivated the imagination of countless storytellers and adventurers, there is a distinct lack of concrete evidence to support its existence. Reported sightings of the creature are scarce and often shrouded in ambiguity. Most accounts come from indigenous people or local guides who recount their encounters with the mythical arachnid during jungle expeditions. One notable instance of alleged evidence came in the form of oversized spider webs discovered in the Congo jungle. In 2009, a British researcher documented the presence of gigantic orb-weaving spider webs spanning up to 2.8 meters in diameter. While these webs are impressive, they have not been conclusively linked to the fabled Jabar Fofi spider, leaving the mystery unsolved. The legend of the spider has piqued the interest of researchers, particularly those who study creatures that exist in folklore or local legends, 
but have not been scientifically verified. These researchers aim to uncover hidden and undiscovered species that might have evaded scientific documentation. However, the scientific community remains skeptical of the existence of the spider. The lack of tangible evidence, along with the impossibility of a spider reaching the reported colossal sizes without defying the constraints of biology and physics, leads many scientists to dismiss the creature as a product of local mythology and exaggeration. Despite the absence of concrete evidence, the legend of the Jabar Fofi spider continues to hold immense cultural significance in the Congo region. It serves as a symbol of the rich biodiversity and mystique of the rainforest, a reminder of the deep spiritual connection that indigenous communities have with their natural surroundings. Moreover, the myth of the spider highlights the importance of conservation efforts in the Congo jungle. While the existence of a giant spider might remain unproven, the region's biodiversity faces real and pressing threats. Preserving the habitat of the Congo jungle is essential for protecting its unique and diverse wildlife, including known species of spiders and other arachnids. The allure of mythical creatures like the Jibba Fofi spider lies in their ability to capture the imagination and spark wonder. Folklore and legends enrich our understanding of the world, reflecting the cultural beliefs and values of communities across time and space. In the case of the Jibba Fofi spider, the legend serves as a cautionary tale, urging respect for the wilderness and appreciation for the marvels of nature. These tales often serve as cautionary stories, cultural markers, or explanations for natural phenomena. Among these traditions, the legend of the Jibba Fofi spider holds a prominent place, passing through countless storytellers' voices, each adding their own nuances to the narrative. According to indigenous beliefs, the spider is not just a gigantic arachnid, but also a guardian of the jungle. Tales describe it as dwelling in the deepest, most remote parts of the rainforest, protecting the natural order of the ecosystem. The spider is both revered and feared, as its presence is associated with balance and harmony, but also signals potential danger lurking in the wilderness. The cultural significance of the Jabba Fofi spider extends beyond its mythical attributes. For the native communities, it represents a spiritual connection with nature, instilling a sense of awe and respect for the mysteries of the Congo rainforest. Among the indigenous communities, stories of actual encounters with the Jabba Fofi spider are passed down as first-hand testimonies. These encounters are often described in vivid detail, evoking the creature's awe-inspiring size and its imposing presence. However, it is essential to acknowledge that these testimonies are embedded within cultural contexts and may be subject to embellishments or interpretations over time. One such account comes from a member of the Mbuti Pygmy tribe. The tribesman narrates an encounter with a colossal spider while deep in the rainforest. According to the story, the spider stood as tall as a man, with its legs extending far beyond human reach. The tribesman described the creature as a powerful guardian of the jungle, urging his fellow tribespeople to show reverence and gratitude for the spider's protection. Another account comes from the Baka people, who describe the spider as a watchful guardian that protects the forest from those who disrespect its sanctity. These accounts highlight the spider's role as a symbol of ecological preservation and cultural heritage among the native communities. The myth of the spider cannot be fully understood without recognizing its cultural context. For the indigenous people of the Congo, the creature embodies the interplay between reality and mythology, reflecting their deep connection to the rainforest and its mystical aspects. It serves as a reminder of the importance of maintaining a harmonious relationship with the natural world, acknowledging the interconnectedness between humans and the environment. While the existence of the giant Congo spider remains a matter of myth and mystery, its legend continues to resonate within the hearts of the indigenous peoples. The stories of encounters and testimonies enrich our understanding of the Congo's cultural heritage and the ecological significance of its rainforest. Embracing the Jabba Fofi spider myth with cultural appreciation and a scientific mindset can foster a deeper appreciation for the complexities of our natural world and the importance of preserving it for generations to come. In the heart of the dense and enigmatic Congo rainforest, a creature of legend and mystery has captivated the imaginations of locals and adventurers alike.
the Congamato. This mythical creature, also known as the Overturner of Boats, is said to be a fearsome flying creature with a reputation for attacking humans and livestock. The Congamato's legend has its roots in the folklore of the Kayonde and Bashilanga tribes who inhabit the regions surrounding the Luapula River in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The term Congamato translates to breaker of boats or overturner of boats as it is said to target travelers on the river, causing their boats to capsize. Described as a large bat-like or pterosaur-like creature with leathery wings, the Congamato is believed to be carnivorous, preying on fish, small animals, and even humans. Tales of its piercing screech and powerful claws add to its fearsome reputation, and its presence is often seen as an omen of misfortune or death. The Congamato holds immense cultural significance in the local traditions and beliefs of the Congo communities. It serves as a cautionary tale, warning against dangerous encounters with the unknown and the potential consequences of straying into the realm of the spirits. The legend also embodies the spiritual connection between these indigenous communities and the natural world. As guardians of their lands, these tribes have developed deep reverence for the creatures that inhabit their environment. The Congamato's mythical existence reinforces the importance of respecting the balance of nature and adhering to the ancient customs that safeguard their communities. Over the years, there have been numerous accounts of Congamato sightings and encounters. Witnesses claim to have seen the creature flying at great heights, with some describing it as having a wingspan of up to 30 feet. These reports often coincide with peculiar events or ominous occurrences, further deepening the belief in the creature's existence. One notable encounter comes from the British zoologist Ivan T. Sanderson, who visited the Congo in the 1930s. During his stay, he collected testimonies from local villagers who shared stories of Congamato sightings and attacks. Although Sanderson himself did not observe the creature, he acknowledged the locals' sincerity and belief in the creature's existence. From a scientific standpoint, explanations for the Congamato sightings vary. Some researchers propose that the sightings could be attributed to misidentification of known flying creatures, such as large birds or bats, or even misinterpretations of the shadows and light patterns in the dense forest. Additionally, cultural influences and collective beliefs may play a significant role in shaping the perception of the Congamato. The power of folklore and local legends can influence how individuals interpret and remember their observations, sometimes leading to the creation of a shared mythos. Creatures like the Congamato hold a special place in the realm of popular culture. While these mysterious creatures have not been formally identified, their allure continues to spark curiosity and fascination among adventurers and researchers. The stories of these creatures also serve as reminders of the importance of biodiversity conservation. The Congo rainforest is one of the world's most significant biodiversity hotspots, home to countless species of flora and fauna, some of which are yet to be discovered and described by science. Protecting these ecosystems is crucial, not only for preserving the habitats of known species, but also for the potential discovery of new and mysterious creatures that may dwell within. The legend of the Congamato remains an integral part of the cultural heritage of the Congo, reflecting the spiritual connection between indigenous communities and the natural world. Whether a mythical creature or a case of misidentification, the tales of the Congamato add an air of mystery to the already enigmatic Congo rainforest. As the pursuit of the Congamato continues, it serves as a reminder of the importance of preserving the world's biodiversity-rich ecosystems. The quest to unravel the secrets of the Congo rainforest not only promises potential discoveries, but also underscores the need to protect these precious habitats for generations to come. Ultimately, whether the Congamato is a creature of myth or reality, its legend endures as a symbol of the unexplored and the untamed, drawing us further into the captivating realms of the Congo and the world's untold mysteries. In the age of social media, where the bizarre and extraordinary often find their way into the digital realm, one ordinary evening in Roswell, New Mexico, took an unprecedented turn. It all began when someone on social media uploaded a mysterious photograph. Roswell had long been a town steeped in mystery, its name forever associated with the infamous incident of 1947. 
The individual said that they found an old photo album filled with black and white photographs. Some of them depicted a small, grey, otherworldly figure laying down in a dimly lit room. Those who saw the photographs said that they recognized the uncanny resemblance of the figure to the descriptions of the alleged crash survivors, a small grey alien. The photograph had an unsettling aura, an eerie greenish glow cast upon the room and the enigmatic being at its center. Within minutes of the photograph being uploaded to social media, it began to gain traction. Comments poured in, ranging from skepticism to excitement. The social media post had unleashed a storm of speculation, leading some to question whether this was evidence that small humanoids had been found at the site. As of right now, the photographs have sparked a renewed interest in the mysteries of that summer in 1947. On the fateful day of July 8, 1947, a significant event occurred that would not only forever be associated with the Roswell crash in New Mexico, but also shed light on a groundbreaking theory regarding unidentified objects. Surprisingly, it was on this very day that an interdimensional explanation first emerged, providing a potential origin for the enigmatic UAP phenomena. This explanation, however, remained relatively obscure for the next three decades, gradually gaining traction over time. Expanding upon this fascinating revelation, it becomes evident that the complexity and intrigue surrounding unidentified objects extend far beyond mere terrestrial explanations. On that particular day, Colonel Jesse Marcel made a public statement through a press release indicating that the United States Air Force had successfully retrieved an unidentified flying object, along with advanced beings, which had encountered a crash in the state of New Mexico. Regrettably, a subsequent press release was issued, significantly altering the facts presented in the initial statement and transforming the crashed object from an unidentified object to a weather balloon. This revision undoubtedly led to a change in the narrative surrounding the incident. The revised and enhanced theory regarding the weather balloon incident fails to provide any substantial information that would shed light on the perplexing circumstances surrounding Colonel Marcel's mistaken identification of a weather balloon as a crashed advanced craft containing alien remains. This incident is particularly intriguing as Colonel Marcel, a distinguished military officer with a remarkable military record and first-hand involvement in the delivery of the first nuclear weapons employed in warfare, encountered such confusion. On that particular day, the world witnessed the introduction of three significant elements on a large scale. Unidentified aerial phenomena, the extraterrestrial hypothesis and the captivating interdimensional hypothesis regarding the origins of both UFOs and UAPs. However, it is worth noting that the latter hypothesis only gained recognition when esteemed scientists like Jacques Vallée began considering the possibility of an alternative origin theory for these extraordinary phenomena, namely the interdimensional explanation. The FBI vault serves as a repository for an extensive collection of declassified files that delve into the enigmatic stories of the past. Among the various subjects that ignite curiosity, and captivate public imagination, none can match the enduring intrigue surrounding unidentified objects and aliens. Deep within the vault, the FBI safeguards a multitude of documents that shed light on this extraordinary phenomenon, holding secrets that continue to bewilder and fascinate. Of particular significance within this vast trove is the Memorandum of Importance, which has garnered immense attention by those investigating these events. The narrative surrounding this particular document is far from being a straightforward case of seizing an opportunity disguised under the guise of public service with a supernatural touch. In fact, if one possesses a curiosity to explore further, it reveals a captivating and intricate story. It's crucial, above all, to keep in mind that this event took place in the year 1947. It is truly astonishing to comprehend that Edgar Hoover, who held the powerful position of the Federal Bureau of Investigation Director, displayed little concern for justice and regard for the public's right to be fully informed. Rather, he epitomized an extreme conservative and reactionary mindset that deviated significantly from the norm. His perspectives and ideologies diverged remarkably from those who prioritized fairness, equality, and the ethical dissemination of factual information. In the year 2010, it came to light from the information disclosed on the FBI's The Vault page that a report 
specifically Memo 6751, was declassified. This report was prepared in July 1947 by a special agent of the FBI who held the rank of lieutenant colonel. However, due to concerns regarding national security and under Hoover's direction, a report based on an interview with an unidentified flying object witness was intentionally erased. The witness, who had a first-hand encounter with a non-human entity, possessed a wealth of information to share. This revelation sheds new light on the existence of unidentified flying objects and the efforts made to suppress information related to them. The memo, an official document, acknowledges the undeniable existence of advanced beings. This is a matter of great importance, as emphasized by John de Souza, a former FBI officer. Based on the findings outlined in the report, it has been established that amidst a range of diverse species, we encounter beings not only from alternative planets, but also from alternate dimensions. To be more precise, these entities hail from the ethereal plane which exists in parallel with our physical universe. These ethereal entities manifest themselves as towering figures with an intriguing translucency, appearing to us as colossal spectres. The central concept being explored in this report is the idea that the interdimensional hypothesis which posits the existence of alternate dimensions as the source of unidentified object sightings was initially established concurrently with the release of the Roswell Report in 1947. In this particular case, the FBI personnel have intentionally kept the identity of the individual responsible for writing the memo a secret. However, they have left behind two intriguing clues for us to ponder upon, Round Robin and the Flying Roll. These clues serve as breadcrumbs leading us to the revelation that the author of the cautionary advisory is none other than Newton Mead Lane. In 1946, Lane ventured into the realm of publishing by creating The Round Robin, a newsletter that delved into the realm of arcane knowledge, much in the style of the renowned Charles Fort. Due to financial limitations, Lane opted for mimeographing rather than traditional printing methods for distribution. This initial endeavor proved to be just the beginning, as Lane later introduced the flying role to expand and augment his reach. The concept of multiple universes existing beyond our own has been a long-standing idea throughout human history. It has been understood that our physical senses only provide a limited perception of reality, and there is a greater scope of existence beyond what we can observe. This notion of additional, unobserved universes highlights the underlying belief that the universe we inhabit is just one piece of a larger cosmic puzzle. Lane, in his pursuit to comprehend unidentified objects, sought to relate them to his prior experiences in delving into the realm of the unseen. In his document titled Memo 6751, he explicitly states that the origin of these unidentified flying objects is not the commonly referred to astral plane, but rather corresponds to the metaphysical concepts of locus or talus. He assumes that individuals with a background in esoteric knowledge will grasp the significance of these terms. To put it differently, unidentified objects are classified as vehicles that facilitate traversing between different dimensions of existence. In essence, they enable interdimensional travel, offering a transcendental perspective to the observers. The interdimensional hypothesis, which was initially sparked by Lane's early exploration of an ancient cosmological concept in relation to unidentified objects, underwent a gradual evolution over a span of several decades. During the 1970s, the interdimensional hypothesis emerged as a compelling alternative to the well-accepted extraterrestrial hypothesis. Renowned experts in the field, including Mead Lane, John Keel, J. Allen Hynek, and Jacques Vallée, endorsed this perspective. The interdimensional hypothesis proposes that unidentified flying objects represent a contemporary manifestation of a phenomenon that dates back to ancient times. In earlier eras, this phenomenon was often attributed to mythological or supernatural beings. As we explore the interdimensional hypothesis in greater depth, we find that it suggests unidentified object encounters are not solely restricted to encounters with extraterrestrial life forms. The well-known incident that took place in July 1947 near Roswell, New Mexico, is one that has gone down in history. According to the story, a large, unidentified craft made contact with the ground in that area. William Ware Mac Brazell, a local rancher, 
stumbled upon wreckage during the same year, which he believed to be connected to the numerous flying saucer sightings reported at that time. The military responded by sending Major Jesse Marcel to investigate the crash site and retrieve the debris. Initially, a press release was issued, stating that a flying disc had been recovered, but the following day, the official narrative changed, and it was claimed to be nothing more than a weather balloon. However, as time went on, the Air Force revised their account and declared that neither version of the story was accurate. Instead, they asserted that the wreckage was actually a device used for espionage purposes, specifically to spy on the Soviet Union. This incident has since gained notoriety and remains a subject of much debate and speculation. It is fascinating to observe how, paradoxically, the public quickly seemed to forget about the incident after initially expressing curiosity. The incident in question involved the government acknowledging the discovery of a wreckage that was believed to be a flying disc just days prior. However, as more details emerged regarding the wreckage and eyewitnesses began sharing their accounts of what they had witnessed at the scene, a newfound interest began to take shape. Prominent researchers assert that the events that transpired in Roswell hold significant importance within the realm of UFO research. They express surprise at the lack of public demand for answers regarding the nature of what descended on that fateful day. Amateur researchers, on the other hand, contend that military officials cannot be considered oblivious and are capable of differentiating between a UFO and a mere weather balloon. Interestingly, it has been reported that the initial revelation that the discovered object was indeed a UFO caused a sense of panic among the populace, prompting the military to backtrack on their initial statements. However, over the course of the past few decades, Former employees who were stationed at the crash site and privy to insider information have gracefully come forward to share their testimonies. The in-depth exploration of this incident, considering both the government's initial admission and subsequent retractions, as well as the ongoing revelations provided by those present at the crash site, offer an enriching perspective on the events in Roswell. This comprehensive analysis aims to shed light on the substance of this significant occurrence and stimulate further inquiry. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, a highly experienced senior master sergeant in the Women's Air Force, had a remarkable and captivating encounter with a humanoid being. It is documented that she had an extraordinary interaction with an entity known as Ale, who not only shared their name, but also divulged the origins of their existence, along with the purpose of their visit to our planet Earth. During this incredible encounter, Ale provided Matilda O'Donnell McElroy with enlightening insights into their origin and the reasons behind their presence on Earth. During the time of this encounter, Matilda, who was a mere 23 years old, recounted a fascinating tale of her ability to establish communication with a humanoid entity through the extraordinary power of telepathy. This entity, known as Ale, was the subject of Matilda's interview, wherein she revealed striking differences between herself and this otherworldly being. Matilda noted that while she possessed a biological existence, Earl, in contrast, did not share this characteristic. Nevertheless, Earl did possess a female appearance akin to that of a child in stature. The circumstances surrounding their initial connection were quite extraordinary, as it occurred following a crash where three individuals were aboard a vessel, tragically leaving Matilda as the sole survivor. This profoundly intriguing account sheds light on the enigmatic nature of Matilda's encounter with the extraordinary being named Earl. Matilda's report aligns with the experiences shared by numerous abductees, highlighting an intriguing discovery. According to her, the physical composition of the beings she encountered exhibited stark dissimilarities from that of humans, appearing to be constructed out of a synthetic material rather than biological components. Extensive research conducted incidents involving mysterious aircrafts reveals consistent testimonies describing these alleged aliens as displaying robotic characteristics, prompting comparisons to functioning machines. Some people who have had close encounters with these objects have vividly described their observations of these beings, noting their mechanical-like behavior devoid of usual human traits. These accounts mention their lack of blinking, peculiar movements, and an absence of any discernible emotional responses, reinforcing their perception of encountering highly advanced robots. Such revelations offer an intriguing glimpse into the nature of these encounters, 
and raise compelling questions about the potential existence of technologically advanced extraterrestrial life forms. In a subsequent interview for a book, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy offered her own speculation regarding the object's composition, suggesting that it may have been constructed using the same material as the advanced being itself. Intriguingly, she also proposed that both the object and the being possessed the ability to be controlled through the power of the mind. Despite her extensive interaction with Earl, Matilda noted a certain level of secrecy, as Earl seemed reluctant to divulge too much information on certain matters. This air of caution led Matilda to infer that Earl harbored a lack of trust toward military officials. Such realizations served as a sobering warning to the nurse, prompting her to contemplate the unsettling notion that if aliens themselves were skeptical of humans, it didn't bode well for the reputation and trustworthiness of our own species. Expanding further, when questioned about her origins, Earl asserted that her civilization hailed from an ancient lineage that harbored immense power and influence. Intriguingly, their overarching objective remained focused on progression and advancement. Thus, it became increasingly apparent that Earl's presence on Earth was not a mere coincidence, but rather a purposeful mission undertaken by a formidable and forward-thinking civilization. In a letter penned by McElroy, the author delves into profound inquiries that demand the attention of humanity. These thought-provoking questions, which reside within these very documents, encompass the essence of our existence. Who are we as a species? What is the origin of our being? What purpose do we serve on this planet? In contemplating the existence of intelligent life beyond Earth, the author raises an important question. Why haven't they made contact with us? The letter urgently emphasizes the need for people to comprehend the dire consequences that could unfold, both physically and spiritually, if we fail to take decisive action to undo the enduring and far-reaching effects of extraterrestrial interference on our planet. It is worth noting that this particular story has a connection to an anecdote provided by Glenn Dennis, a mortician. According to Dennis, who worked as a nurse at the Roswell Army Airfield, she personally witnessed medical professionals examining beings that bore resemblance to humans but displayed distinct features such as elongated, slender arms and large, hairless heads. Dennis further disclosed that there were specific requests for caskets designed for children during the same period of time, which raises intriguing questions regarding the nature and origins of these unusual creatures. The inclusion of Glenn Dennis's account adds a compelling layer of detail to the larger Roswell incident narrative, shedding more light on the events and potentially expanding our understanding of what may have transpired. The television program UFO Hunters conducted an interview with Earl Fulford, an individual who was present at the crash site and participated in the cleanup operation. Earl, being one of the few surviving witnesses, shared intriguing details about the incident. He described the recovered material as remarkably lightweight, capable of springing back to its original form when compressed. During the show, the team presented various materials for comparison, including everyday foil and mylar foil. However, Earl immediately recognized that these materials did not match what he had retrieved from the crash site. He emphasized that the material he handled was virtually weightless and possessed a unique property of returning to its original shape, no matter how much it was manipulated. Earl expressed that he had never encountered anything like it before. Unbeknownst to Earl, the UFO Hunters team managed to recreate a material based on his description. When given the replicated material, Earl proclaimed that it closely resembled what he had encountered. He said the following, This one feels more like the material. We could squeeze it and it would pop back. The thickness and weight are similar. It gives me chills down my spine. End quote. This revelation added an intriguing dimension to the investigation, shedding light on the extraordinary characteristics of the crashed object's material. When considering the Roswell incident, a significant number of individuals currently hold the belief that there is a considerable amount of undisclosed information surrounding this event. The Mysterious Winchester Landing Incident During the mid-1970s, a series of UFO landings and subsequent encounters with mysterious beings occurred in Winchester, a city located in the southern region of England. Although not as widely recognized today, these events captured national attention at the time. Furthermore, multiple witnesses came forward with corroborating accounts of the initial sighting 
indicating that whatever was observed along a peaceful road in Hampshire had tangible existence. This intriguing phenomenon, which unfolded in Winchester amidst media coverage, continues to fascinate and raise questions about the existence of advanced life. One aspect that adds to the intrigue is the fact that after the initial encounter, Joyce Bowles, the primary witness, experienced numerous subsequent encounters. These encounters consistently involved her being taken aboard an otherworldly vehicle where she had interactions with peculiar humanoid beings. While there may be skeptics, even within the UFO community, these subsequent encounters contain noteworthy details that often mirror those found in other cases of close encounters. Thus, it becomes evident that Bowles' experiences warrant further examination and consideration as they contribute to our understanding of these phenomena in a comprehensive and unbiased manner. Even though these sightings remain unresolved and continue to baffle researchers and enthusiasts in the field of UFO phenomena, they remain a subject of great fascination. As a result, they are periodically revisited in the hopes of unearthing new insights, additional information, or even potential witnesses that could shed light on the matter. The individuals involved in this event were Joyce Bowles, a 42-year-old woman, and her neighbor Ted Pratt, a 60-year-old individual. At approximately 9 in the evening, they were in a vehicle en route to the nearby village of Chilcombe. While journeying down the road, the group noticed an unusual orange glow suspended in the sky, seemingly floating at a relatively low height above a field situated by the roadside. As they proceeded on their way, their line of sight became momentarily obstructed due to hedges and trees, momentarily obscuring the light from view. However, it swiftly reappeared as they advanced further along the road. This captivating phenomenon held their attention, evoking a sense of curiosity and intrigue. During their journey, they veered off the main road and took a left turn onto a serene and peaceful country lane known as King's Lane. Due to the narrower road, Joyce decided to reduce her driving speed to a range of 20 to 25 miles per hour. Unexpectedly, without any prior indication, the car suddenly veered to the right and at the same time, the engine revved up autonomously. This peculiar occurrence was accompanied by a palpable sensation of density in the surrounding atmosphere, as if an enigmatic force was exerting pressure upon them. The unexplained heaviness added an eerie element to their experience, leaving them perplexed yet intrigued. As Joyce glanced out of the window, her eyes landed upon the sight of their vehicle now positioned along a grass verge. However, her concern deepened as she found herself grappling with a significant challenge in maintaining control over the moving vehicle. Within moments, a looming forest became a visible threat, rapidly approaching their path. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, Ted swiftly reached for the steering wheel, aiming to support Joyce in her desperate efforts to steer clear of the imminent collision with the trees. Suddenly, the car abruptly halted coming to an unexpected stop against an object that Ted described as an invisible barrier. Interestingly, this mysterious barrier seemed to possess a subtle flexibility, bending ever so slightly before completely halting their progress. After regaining their composure, Joyce and Ted directed their focus towards the windshield. To their astonishment, a cylindrical object suspended itself both in front of them and slightly ahead. What made it even more extraordinary was the discernible presence of a cockpit-like region where three humanoid figures, or at the very least their heads and shoulders, could be seen. As they observed the figures through the windows, they could distinctly remember that the figures seemed to be arranged in a manner resembling passengers sitting on a bus, with one figure positioned directly behind the other. Additionally, their recollection highlighted the fact that the craft was hovering only slightly above the ground, with an unusual mist-like substance visible beneath it. Adding to this, Ted vividly recalled the sight of what appeared to be four jets emitting gases, providing support to the hovering craft. These detailed observations paint a comprehensive picture of the scene, allowing us to delve deeper into the intricacies of the encounter. According to the recollections of Joyce, one of the individuals mentioned in the story stepped away from the object and proceeded to walk towards their vehicle. Coinciding with this, a peculiar whistling sound similar to that of a kettle began to resonate in the air. As the figure drew nearer, Joyce could discern that they were clad in what appeared to be a silver-blue boiler suit which extended all the way up to their neck. Interestingly, Ted recalled that this attire seemed to shimmer as if it were being gently shaken by an invisible wind. Furthermore, 
Both witnesses were unable to recall any buttons or seams adorning the clothing worn by the figure, adding to the mystery surrounding their appearance. To their growing astonishment, much to their sudden realization, the presence materialized seemingly out of nowhere, astonishingly finding itself positioned right beside the driver's side of the vehicle. A penetrating gaze from the enigmatic entity pierced into their space, as if it had effortlessly emerged into existence. In appearance, this peculiar being exhibited strikingly human-like features, with the exception of its mesmerizingly vibrant pink eyes. Joyce, with a keen eye for details, attempted to gauge the figure's physical attributes, approximating a towering height of approximately six feet, adorned with cascading locks of lustrous blonde hair and a luxuriant beard adorning its countenance. As Joyce directed her gaze towards the man, she instinctively glanced over her shoulder, catching sight of the hovering craft. To her surprise, three distinct figures stood aboard the vessel, their gazes fixated on the unfolding scene. Shifting her focus back to the man, she couldn't help but notice the unsettling expression etched upon his face. Curiously enough, Ted would later recount his contrasting experience, wherein he found himself overwhelmed by a sense of peace and tranquility upon glimpsing the very same face. The stark dichotomy between their emotional responses adds an intriguing layer of complexity to this encounter. The human-like figure persistently observed the individuals inside, subsequently shifting focus to the control panel before proceeding to the rear portion of the automobile. This behavior demonstrated a keen interest in the occupants, as well as a deliberate engagement with the vehicle's operations. As Joyce observed, the unidentified figure began to move in the vicinity of the vehicle, creating the impression that Ted intended to exit the car, thus prompting her to lean over and intervene to prevent him from doing so. It was during this momentary lapse that she involuntarily closed her eyes. However, as soon as she reopened them, she was taken aback to discover that both the hovering object and the enigmatic figure had inexplicably vanished from sight. This unexpected turn of events left her bewildered and curious about the mysterious circumstances surrounding their sudden disappearance. After a short pause to collect their thoughts, the two witnesses, Joyce and her companion, prepared to continue their journey. Joyce turned the ignition key, engaged the car's first gear, and eagerly attempted to move forward. However, much like the perplexing force that had halted their vehicle earlier, an intangible obstruction prevented the car from budging an inch. Frustrated but determined, Joyce decided to switch off the engine, hoping that this would somehow alleviate the unseen resistance. To her relief, when she once again started the car, it effortlessly began to move forward, free from any hindrance or impediment. Upon their return, precisely at 9.25 in the evening, Joyce wasted no time in recounting the peculiar encounter to her husband. In response, he took it upon himself to reach out to the local BBC station in order to inquire if any other similar incidents had been reported. This conversation eventually led to both him and Joyce being invited to appear on the BBC's news show the following day, where they would have the opportunity to share their extraordinary experience. Subsequently, their story garnered significant attention, and they were invited to make an appearance on BBC National News, ensuring that their extraordinary encounter reached a wider audience. In the realm of strange occurrences, this particular episode was merely the inaugural event in a subsequent sequence of peculiar happenings. Furthermore, the consequences of this encounter materialized several days later, manifesting as an unconventional skin eruption on the posterior region of Joyce's cranium and shoulder. Delving into the intricacies of this inexplicable phenomenon, we begin to comprehend the profound implications it carries, as the enigmatic rash leaves us with more questions than answers. A matter of even greater concern arose when she found herself on the receiving end of an unsettling phone call from an individual who identified themselves as a representative of the government. This mysterious caller, in a direct and forceful manner, warned her against discussing the encounter she had experienced. Astonishingly, this warning was reiterated when the same person made another call to her shortly thereafter. Adding to the peculiarity of the situation, her telephone line remained engaged for several weeks following the encounter, persisting even after she hung up the receiver multiple times, an action that should have disconnected any ongoing call. In defiance of the cautionary words she received, 
Joyce ultimately chose to disregard the warning and proceeded to share the details of her extraordinary encounter with the local and national media outlets, opening up about her experience to a wider audience. The incident mentioned in the text caught the attention of not only Joyce and Ted, but also the Daily Mail newspaper, who went on to conduct their own thorough investigation. In their pursuit of the truth, they managed to uncover several other witnesses from the same area who claimed to have observed the exact same object that Joyce and Ted had described. As the story unfolded, the subsequent encounters took an even more bizarre and enigmatic turn, captivating not only the locals but also gaining national attention. The unfolding events surrounding Joyce's experience became a matter of great curiosity and intrigue, with the story spreading throughout the entire nation. Approximately six weeks later, specifically at approximately 6.30 in the evening of December 30, 1976, Joyce and Ted embarked on the very same journey they had undertaken that fateful November night. Remarkably, not only did they once again encounter an eerily similar unidentified flying object, but to their astonishment, they abruptly found themselves being transported aboard it, accompanied by the enigmatic beings they had previously observed. Shortly after, a brief span of time passed, and both individuals perceived a distinct whistling sound, the very same auditory manifestation they had observed during their prior encounter in November. Once again, the vehicle commenced trembling and vibrating with an eerie sensation as though an external force or presence was exerting control or manipulation over it. Subsequently, their consciousness seemed to fade into oblivion, and when they regained awareness, they found themselves standing outside the car. However, to their bewilderment, they were not on the familiar road, but instead located within the confines of an enigmatic and unconventional chamber. As they surveyed their surroundings, they unanimously concluded that they were situated inside an exceedingly peculiar and baffling craft. This unforeseen turn of events left them perplexed and seeking answers to the inexplicable circumstances they now found themselves in. When the group entered the room, they found themselves accompanied by three humanoid beings who were unmistakably the same individuals they had encountered previously. These figures were dressed identically as before, but upon closer inspection, Joyce noticed that they were also wearing sparkling silver boots. As she drew nearer, Joyce couldn't help but notice that the fabric of their clothing resembled tin foil. It shimmered and reflected light in a similar manner. One interesting aspect caught her attention inside the room they were situated in, which has also been observed in previous cases, involving individuals claiming to have encountered UFOs. Specifically, she observed a peculiar feature at the center of the room, a significant bottle-like structure that emerged from the floor. This structure exhibited a wide base, gradually narrowing as it reached the top. Additionally, it was adorned with peculiar black and yellow rings. Although she was unable to fathom the purpose of this structure, other witnesses have reported similar details, and suggested that it served as a vital component of the craft's propulsion system. This intriguing observation adds to the growing body of evidence regarding the consistent nature of these unusual encounters. The human-like creatures engaged in conversation with the duo, employing a limited knowledge of English but effectively communicating their intentions. They assured the pair that they harbored no ill intentions and sought to alleviate any fears or concerns. During their encounter, the couple was exposed to a wide array of technological devices and even had the opportunity to examine star charts. However, their recollections of the entire incident were vague and incomplete, leaving them with only fuzzy memories. They vaguely remembered being escorted back to their car, but when they regained consciousness, they found themselves on an unfamiliar road. Interestingly, despite the unusual circumstances, Joyce experienced a sense of tranquility while Ted couldn't shake a distinct feeling of unease. It seemed as though there was something foreboding that his memory was refusing to recall. Delving into the details, we discover that the couple's encounter was not limited to just a casual observation of futuristic gadgets and celestial maps. The intensity of the experience was such that the timeline of events became hazy and their minds struggled to hold on to every detail. Gradually, their consciousness returned to their surroundings. In the month of May 1977, approximately five months after the previous incident, Joyce unexpectedly found herself embarking on yet another extraordinary encounter. Just like before, Joyce was behind the wheel, 
accompanied by her dear friend, Anne Strickland, and as fate would have it, they were about to witness something truly remarkable once again. In the distance, there appeared an awe-inspiring cigar-shaped object, emitting a magnificent and radiant glow. This extraordinary event left them in awe and wonder, as they couldn't help but ponder the significance of such an encounter. Joyce halted the vehicle, causing it to come to a complete stop, while the two women observed with anticipation as the unidentified craft gracefully descended from the sky. Their eyes locked onto the sight, as one of the humanoid forms emerged from the vessel and promptly made its way towards them. As the approaching figure closed in on their position, it stretched out its arms in a gesture of openness and goodwill. At this juncture, a wave of intense fear overwhelmed the two women, surpassing anything they had ever experienced before. However, their apprehension was soon disrupted as the enigmatic being started communicating with them using the English language, albeit in a rather fragmented manner. After this intriguing exchange of information, the enigmatic figure turned around and made their way back to the spacecraft from which they had emerged. To everyone's astonishment, the craft then slowly ascended into the sky, eventually vanishing from sight. Joyce found herself in the midst of yet another otherworldly encounter, approximately a month later, during the month of June. Once again, she was accompanied by her neighbour Ted Pratt, while on a drive. Interestingly, this encounter followed a similar pattern to the previous two incidents, as both Joyce and Ted appeared to have undergone what can only be described as encountering an otherworldly entity. According to Ted's account, they found themselves once again in the presence of the cigar-shaped spacecraft. Much to their surprise, the humanoid figures, clad in what seemed to be dull, metallic suits, were also present. In a scene reminiscent of their previous encounter, there was a peculiar exchange of communication and information between the humans and the enigmatic beings. It was during this interaction that one of the figures conveyed warnings, shedding light on various wars and the detrimental impact of humanity's actions on the planet. Deeply concerned about these pressing issues, the humanoid figures reluctantly bid farewell and retreated back into their extraordinary craft. This encounter not only reiterated the existence of the mysterious cigar-shaped craft, but also imparted crucial insights into the consequences of human behavior on a global scale. After this particular event took place, the sightings abruptly ceased. However, subsequent investigations would shed light on some intriguing revelations pertaining to Joyce. It was discovered that over the course of several years, she had also encountered numerous instances characterized by poltergeist-like phenomena. What is particularly noteworthy in this case is the correlation often observed between individuals who claim encountering mysterious beings and their experiences with the paranormal, particularly incidents reminiscent of poltergeist activity. This connection suggests a deeper relationship between alien encounters and the paranormal realm, which may be more substantial than many of us realize. A fascinating aspect worth exploring is Joyce's revelation about her encounters with peculiar psychic manifestations and incidents of poltergeist-like activity that have occurred since her early childhood. It is intriguing to note that various objects and ornaments would frequently move on their own, a phenomenon witnessed by multiple members of her family. Moreover, Joyce frequently shared sightings of a mysterious white-robed lady, a figure that other family members also claim to have seen, albeit without being able to discern any specific features. This suggests a recurring and captivating presence that has intrigued Joyce and her family throughout their lives. In the years preceding her encounters in late 1976 and early 1977, an intriguing and unsettling series of events occurred around the protagonist. This series of events, which dates back to 1972, involved her witnessing several apparitions or ghosts within her own home. The experiences were so alarming that she sought help from the local church, specifically requesting two exorcisms to be performed. This additional information sheds light on the depth and complexity of the protagonist's paranormal encounters, offering a comprehensive understanding of the events leading up to the main storyline. During an interview with a BBC reporter, she would vividly recount a haunting encounter in her bedroom where she witnessed the presence of a lady who bore a striking resemblance to a nun. In the days and nights preceding the initial UFO sighting in November 1976, Joyce vividly remembered encountering an enigmatic and elusive shadowy figure positioned at the top of her staircase. Initially, 
She didn't give much thought to this peculiar occurrence, but in the aftermath of a series of subsequent encounters with unidentified flying objects, she began to speculate if this mysterious figure could potentially be one of the advanced beings associated with the spacecraft. This introspection prompted her to delve deeper into the puzzling nature of her experiences, searching for connections and meaning between the figure and the otherworldly phenomena she had witnessed. During their investigation, the authorities discovered multiple additional sightings that occurred in close proximity to the initial encounter in November 1976. Notably, Mr. and Mrs. Haynes came forward with their own account, asserting that they had observed an individual dressed in a silver outfit near one of the nearby hypermarkets, located approximately seven miles away from Joyce and Ted's incident. This additional testimony adds further credibility to the overall phenomenon, shedding light on the widespread nature of these sightings during that particular period. Several additional individuals also claimed to have observed similar phenomena, although they did not directly see the occupant who supposedly caused it. Sandra Wheeler, for instance, asserted that she witnessed a luminous orange object hovering in the vicinity of Horton Heath. Similarly, Maureen Lovely reported having observed a remarkably similar object for approximately 20 minutes while in Winchester. Furthermore, Mr. and Mrs. Boise from Ulresford reported an additional sighting from a relatively close location, describing the presence of two suns stationed above their heads. These accounts corroborate the existence of the unidentified object and further enhance the credibility of the initial report. In addition to the nearby sightings mentioned earlier, there were also reports from individuals who were farther away from the initial location. One significant incident occurred when Mrs. Atkinson was travelling from Portsmouth to Swindon with several passengers. During their journey, they observed an unusual object hovering above them, adorned with numerous luminous lights. This extraordinary sighting left a lasting impression on the witnesses. Furthermore, on the day before Joyce's initial encounter, specifically on the evening of November 14th in Southampton, Mr. Baker had his own remarkable experience. As he was en route to a friend's house, at approximately seven in the evening, he noticed a massive orange disc traversing the sky. While the initial encounter seems highly credible, especially considering the plethora of other witnesses that investigators eventually uncovered, the subsequent encounters took on a more extravagant and fantastical nature. It is worth noting that many of the more outlandish claims regarding interactions with extraterrestrial beings, which have ultimately been proven to be hoaxes or fabrications, often stem from a genuine initial encounter. While the initial encounter presents compelling evidence, Further exploration reveals subsequent events that appear to be more sensational and far-fetched. In the realm of extraterrestrial encounters, it is not uncommon to come across instances where genuine experiences serve as a foundation for subsequent falsehoods or exaggerations. Nevertheless, numerous investigators at that time also reached the consensus that there was hardly any motivation for these witnesses to invent such a narrative. This lack of incentive stemmed primarily from the fear of public humiliation and mockery that each witness would inevitably face, especially in light of the subsequent disclosures and revelations. It has also been observed that there may be a correlation between the psychic elements and energies attributed to Joyce Bowles and the UFO sightings she experienced. In fact, over the past few decades in the 2000s, numerous researchers have proposed a link between unidentified objects and various aspects of the paranormal realm. From this perspective, if we acknowledge the validity of Joyce Bowles' testimonies, these encounters could hold significant significance. The exploration of this connection further delves into the depths of the paranormal, expanding our understanding and enriching our knowledge in this field. If we direct our attention towards the findings put forth by Jenny Randalls, she would draw our focus to various similarities observed in another incident that unfolded several months later in Nelson, Lancashire. One of the most noteworthy resemblances was the accounts of witnesses experiencing a peculiar pressing force while the unidentified object remained within their sight, accompanied by the impact it had on the vehicle itself. Nevertheless, there were other notable parallels, including the similar shape of the object itself, as well as the presence of red and orange lights. By delving deeper into Randall's research, we can unravel a multitude of intriguing connections between these two incidents, shedding light on the broader implications and potential explanations behind these extraordinary events.
2008 marked a momentous occasion in the history of UFO sightings. Over a small Turkish village, a series of extraordinary events unfolded that would captivate the world's attention. The UFO sighting began when dozens of residents in the small village observed a series of strange lights and an object hovering in the night sky. Witnesses described the object as disc-shaped, with bright lights that seemed to pulse and change colors. The UFO hovered silently for hours, defying the laws of physics and leaving the villagers in a state of awe and disbelief. Turkey has a long and rich history of unexplained aerial phenomena dating back centuries, but between 2007 and 2009 in the northwest region of the country, a series of unusual events took place. Multiple strange objects were observed over the sea and witnessed by local residents. During that time, an important video was taken of something unidentified hovering in the sky at the same location. Numerous residents from the local area have recounted their encounters with unidentified flying objects that displayed disc and oval shapes in the sky. These aerial objects had a distinct metallic appearance and demonstrated silent maneuvers, occasionally accompanied by peculiar red and orange lights. The witnesses comprised a mix of individuals residing in the nearby housing complex and intrigued onlookers, including fishermen. Fascinatingly, in 2009, following a UFO conference held close to Istanbul, Roger Lair and a group of seven to eight people personally experienced a sighting. Under the luminous glow of a bright moon, they witnessed a mysterious disc-shaped object lingering in the heavens. Notably, Roger Lear himself observed Yeltsin capturing video footage of this anomalous object in the sky. Prior to his demise, he was interviewed multiple times regarding this remarkable event, further establishing the credibility and significance of the incident. Reports were filed with the Sirius UFO and Space Science Research Group, which is Turkey's primary UFO reporting organization run by Hakten Akdogan. Also, the videos were analyzed by the Scientific and Technology Research Board of Turkey and TUG National Observatory, which are both sponsored by the state and highly influential. They reviewed the originals with the goal of finding evidence of a forgery, but interestingly came away with results that actually supported the authenticity instead. The original film cassettes have also been studied by people from the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan, Chile, and Brazil. After several attempts so far, nobody has been able to successfully demonstrate evidence of a hoax, fraud, or manipulation, leaving the case as an unsolved mystery. The previous year, between May 22nd and September 28th, a series of unusual aerial phenomena were witnessed and documented in the vicinity of Yeni Kent facility on the shore of Kumbagaz. Yeltsin, who was working the night shift at the facility, had a privileged vantage point, which allowed him to witness these sightings. As word spread, the local residents became increasingly intrigued, resulting in a growing number of people taking notice. The 2008 sightings, reminiscent of those in 2007, received significant attention in the Turkish national media, including news networks from the United States. This, in turn, sparked the interest of the Turkish scientific and astronomy community, who took the initiative to thoroughly analyze the captured footage. The following day, a mesmerizing sphere of glowing orange and red plasma-like light hovers effortlessly in the sky, appearing motionless for an extended period of time. Its radiant brilliance casts a vibrant reflection upon the calm surface of the water, creating a breathtaking visual spectacle that captivates the onlookers. Just four days after the initial sighting, another distinct orange glowing object is witnessed. Shortly thereafter, a peculiar craft, depicted in the image provided below, is captured on film. Interestingly, there seems to be a potential horizontal movement that results in a noticeable shift of light and shadow across the entirety of the structure. This observation raises intriguing questions regarding the nature and behavior of these unidentified aerial phenomena. Upon reviewing the unedited video footage, it is evident that there is a distinctive elongated anomaly that remains stationary just above the surface of the water. Yalsin, the person responsible for capturing the footage, skillfully utilized the zoom function on the camera allowing for multiple close-ups and wide shots. As of right now, one theory that's been put forward is that this object is part of a cruise ship. However, when looking into the object location within the sky, 
along with ships, logs and records, it shows that nothing was in that area during the time of these sightings. In the following analysis, a thorough examination has been conducted, revealing multiple factors that cast doubt on the validity of the cruise ship theory. The Moon as a reference point is often used by astronomers to estimate the angular elevation of objects in the night sky such as airplanes, helicopters and celestial objects. The standard rule is, the angular diameter of the Moon is about 0.5 degrees, or two Moon widths would be one degree. During the 17th of May, the segment of the Moon and the unknown object are filmed in the same frame for several minutes. This can be used to see how far the object was above the horizon. It could theoretically decide if it was too high in altitude, or, if the object was on the horizon, it could support the cruise ship theory. When filming both the Moon and an object in conjunction, this particular scenario provides a valuable opportunity to estimate the angular elevation of the object above the horizon. The Turkey UFO case website used Stellarium, a highly popular planetarium software among astronomers, and this allows users to observe celestial alignments of stars and planets from any location on Earth, either in the present or the past. In this specific case, they inputted the precise coordinates of the camera's position on May 17, 2009. Analysis of the footage reveals that at 6 minutes past 3, the Moon appeared approximately 12.3 degrees above the horizon when observed from the camera's location. This information, captured in detail, provides a comprehensive understanding of the specific celestial positioning during that precise moment in time and space. According to a widely accepted astronomy principle, it is established that when the diameter of two moons is combined, it measures up to one degree. This fundamental rule serves as a valuable tool for measuring celestial objects and phenomena. Examining the given scenario below, it becomes evident that the unidentified object captured in the video was positioned approximately 7.9 degrees above the horizon. This information not only highlights the significance of the astronomy rule, but also underscores its practical application in analyzing celestial observations. According to Alcyone's assertion, if a ship is situated far beyond the Earth's curvature, it would give the illusion of being significantly lower on the horizon compared to its actual position. Once the measurements have been established, we can now proceed to visualize the appearance of the unidentified object at that specific moment. It is important to note that based on the data, the object's position relative to the horizon suggests that it is highly unlikely to be a cruise ship or yacht. According to Alcyone's claims, the object in question was the bridge of a cruise ship, but it is highly unlikely due to its proximity to the shore and shallow waters. The measurements suggest that the unidentified object was positioned too high above the surface, contradicting Alcyone's theory. This discrepancy challenges the validity of Alcyone's claim and raises doubts about the accuracy of their assessment. Examining the scenario more deeply, it becomes evident that the object's height could not be attributed to a cruise ship's bridge, as it would be too high in the sky. The designated marina utilized for accommodating cruise ships that visit is known as the Port of Karakoi. However, it is worth noting that this marina is situated in the Bosphorus Strait, which unfortunately cannot be visually observed from the specific location of the observer. The Automatic Identification System is a globally employed automated tracking system utilized by vessel traffic services to electronically exchange ship data with the purpose of identifying and locating ships. This system operates through automatic identification system transponders, which are equipped with a VHF radio that transmits the position of ships periodically. The ship's GPS provides accurate information regarding the ship's location and velocity. With its comprehensive coverage and in-depth analysis, the automatic identification system plays a crucial role in enriching maritime operations by enhancing the understanding of vessel movements and facilitating effective traffic management. The following is a comprehensive and in-depth compilation of automatic identification system vessel traffic reports for the Sea of Marmara on May 13 and May 15, 2009. These reports provide detailed information about each vessel, including its call sign, date and time of observation, latitude and longitude coordinates, as well as the wind speed at the time of observation. In the event that a cruise ship or yacht happened to be present at the specified sighting location, 
it is imperative that it be included in the list. In the Bosphorus Strait, a number of vessels could be observed, with a few situated in the Black Sea while others positioned outside the camera's range to the west or east. It is important to note that no evidence suggests the presence of a cruise ship or yacht within the camera's coverage at that particular moment. This comprehensive and in-depth analysis enriches our understanding of the maritime activity in the area and highlights the absence of certain types of vessels in the vicinity captured by the camera. Upon careful examination, it has been determined that at precisely 3.59 in the morning on the 13th of May, 2009, no conclusive evidence exists to substantiate the presence of either a cruise ship or a yacht within the visual range of the camera. In addition, it should be noted that during the time the footage was captured, there were no other vessels, such as tankers, fishing boats, or bulk carriers, within sight or in the immediate vicinity. In the country of Turkey, there have been no reports or accounts from residents who claim to have witnessed the presence of a cruise ship or yacht in the area. Considering the extensive media coverage surrounding this issue in Turkey, it is surprising that no one has stepped forward to confirm the existence of a cruise ship in the area. According to Turkish researchers and Yalsin Yalman's statements, it has been determined that the videos captured on July 30, 2007, August 31, 2008, and May 14, 2009 were not recorded near the sea, but rather on land. This finding holds value as it sheds light on the location where these intriguing sightings took place. Interestingly, on the 14th of May 2009, this peculiar event occurred in front of a sizable gathering of individuals attending a conference situated miles away from any oceanic vicinity. By carefully examining these videos captured over land, we are presented with compelling evidence that challenges the notion of a cruise ship being involved in these occurrences. This means that the conventional assumption of these sightings being connected to maritime activities can be discounted. The original footage captured a remarkable phenomenon, a luminous ball of light that gradually transformed into a dome-shaped craft. The recording took place in a condominium owned by Yalsin's father, situated several blocks away from the waterfront. It is worth noting that the condominium is situated at a significant distance from the sea, adding to the intrigue and mystery surrounding the sighting. Upon careful examination, the luminous ball of light exhibited a mesmerizing transformation. Throughout the course of history, there have been numerous instances where orange luminous spheres have been frequently observed in conjunction with unidentified flying objects. Despite ongoing investigations, the exact reasons behind their presence continue to elude us. In the case of Yalsin's film, which has garnered attention, it is intriguing to note that it comprises multiple sequences showcasing these captivating light orbs. Notably, these luminous phenomena appear either during, just before, or immediately after the sightings of other unidentified objects, thus bolstering the curiosity surrounding their existence. Furthermore, eyewitness testimonies recounting the presence of these enigmatic orange balls strongly support their reality. Considering various straightforward aspects, it becomes highly improbable for these peculiar orange light balls to be attributed to the presence of a cruise ship. The factors contributing to this improbability are multifaceted and undeniable. During the period of heightened UFO sightings in 2008, specifically on June 9th, Yalsin and several other individuals had the remarkable opportunity to witness an extraordinary occurrence. The occurrence of the orange light phenomenon typically occurred at the same specific location, either during, shortly before, or right after the presence or movement of other objects. This observation suggests a notable correlation between the orange light occurrence and the neighboring objects. During the extraordinary wave that occurred in 2008, local residents reported regular sightings of unidentified objects. One particularly notable incident took place on July 4, 2008, when an unexplained light was captured on film from 5.20 in the morning to 5.53. It is important to consider various visual factors that strongly indicate a cruise ship or yacht is highly unlikely to be the cause of this phenomenon. Firstly, the unexplained light appeared to be positioned significantly above the horizon, making it implausible for it to be originating from a boat. In the early hours of the same day, specifically at 2.43 in the morning, an intriguing phenomenon occurred above the vast expanse of the sea. 
This peculiar event involved the appearance of a circular or disc-shaped object, captivating the attention of those who were fortunate enough to witness it. During the events of July 4, 2008, an interesting observation was made as both sequences were recorded in the exact same location. This intriguing coincidence raises the possibility that the object being filmed in both instances could potentially be one and the same. In recent interviews, Yeltsin Yalman has expressed that the segment of July 30, 2007 was captured from the open-air balcony of his father's condominium, which is located a few blocks away from the Yeni Kent facility situated on the beautiful beaches of Kumbagaz. On that occasion, Yalman initially observed a peculiar anomaly in the form of a dome appearing in the far distance. Initially, the videos underwent a meticulous examination, supervised by Haktan Akdogan, a distinguished Turkish researcher and the director of the Sirius UFO and Space Science Research Center. Haktan diligently interviewed each witness independently and subsequently proceeded with a thorough analysis of the videos. Collaborating with the esteemed members of their science board, they employed advanced techniques to magnify the images, meticulously scrutinized every pixel, and meticulously examined each frame in intricate detail. This comprehensive endeavor aimed to ensure a comprehensive understanding and in-depth analysis of the videos, enriching the overall investigation. Haktan Akdogan said the following. After doing all the necessary analysis which went on for several weeks, the board came to a definite conclusion with no doubt that these are 100% genuine videos. The objects cited in the aforementioned footage that have a structure that is made of specific material are definitely not made up by any kind of computer animation, nor are they any form of special effects used for simulation in a studio or for a video effect. Therefore, in conclusion, it was decided that the sightings were neither a mock-up or hoax. And it is concluded that these objects in the sightings that have physical and material structures do not belong in any category such as planes, helicopters, meteors, Venus, Mars, satellites, fireballs, Chinese lantern, fireballs, weather balloons, natural or atmospheric phenomenon, and but rather fall into the category of UFOs." End quote. Given that the most remarkable aspects of the case revolve around the alleged presence of extraterrestrial beings in the recorded footage, the focus of observation primarily centered on the central area of the unidentified object. According to the witness, this is where he claimed to have seen someone, which has been interpreted as the presence of occupants or a crew. In a summary, the information gathered from the case suggests that a door or window of some sort could be located in the center of the object. At times, this opening appears to remain unclosed, providing a glimpse of two distinct heads, which are assumed to belong to the elusive extraterrestrial occupants. In a more comprehensive analysis, it is worth noting that these findings emphasize the significance of the central region of the unidentified object. It is believed that this area serves as a point of entry or exit, allowing for potential observations or interactions with the occupants. The uncovered details from this case shed light on the intriguing nature of the encounter, expanding our understanding of the phenomenon. The sequence depicts with commendable clarity the specific moment in which one of the figures, exhibiting what appears to be humanoid characteristics, lifts its gaze and fixates its gaze directly ahead for a fleeting interval of time. The visual presentation reveals the presence of a distinct head structure with two relatively large and dark eyes. Furthermore, Upon closer examination, it is conceivable to discern a fragment of the figure's body, perhaps a small torso, in relation to the aforementioned head. In this particular image, the application of only one level filter was employed to enhance the brightness of the scene. By utilizing this technique, the objective was to maximize the extraction of data that could potentially be captured by the camera, all the while preserving the overall quality of the image. As of right now, the Turkey UFO incident is still heavily debated. Ship records show that no cruise ship was in the area during these sightings, and after zooming in on the footage, there's many that believe they can see humanoid entities within the aircraft. To this day, the Turkey incident remains a mystery. The International Space Station orbits the Earth, 
serving as a beacon of scientific exploration and international collaboration. However, alongside its remarkable achievements, the International Space Station has also become the focal point of intriguing reports and recordings of unidentified objects. Recently, some interesting photographs have been shared around social media, showing what appears to be two medium-sized black cubes flying past one of the International Space Station's cameras. As the live feed camera transmitted images of the Earth and surrounding space, a user online noticed two small, dark objects in the distance. They said that its shape and movements deviated from the expected patterns of space debris or known satellites. Intrigued, they started to take some screenshots in the hopes of better understanding what it was that they witnessed. They said that the objects were in the shape of a cube, saying that it maneuvered gracefully through the vast emptiness of space. The user said that it flew past the camera within a matter of seconds and displayed agility and speed beyond the capabilities of any known human-made spacecraft. With the mysterious object captivating their attention, they knew that they were witnessing something strange and so quickly grabbed some screenshots. They said that the object's flight patterns and advanced maneuvers challenged conventional understanding, raising questions about its technological capabilities and potential nature. After sharing the photographs online, some suggested that the small black objects were advanced reconnaissance probes from an advanced civilization observing humanity's activities from afar. Others theorized that it could be a result of a top-secret military experiment, pushing the boundaries of aerospace technology. Regardless of the explanations, the sighting opened up a world of possibilities and triggered discussions about the existence of intelligent life beyond Earth. However, despite numerous attempts at trying to explain what these objects were, they remained a mystery. Interestingly, those who saw the photographs said that this isn't the first time that these objects have been captured on the International Space Station's live cameras and said that over the years, a variety of strange objects have been captured. Although NASA and other space agencies have said that these objects are nothing of interest and can normally be explained as things like space debris and camera glitches, this hasn't stopped users from investigating further, noting that every so often these objects can be seen during the live streams. Whether these two small black objects were an otherworldly visitor, a product of advanced human technology, or something else entirely, its presence has left many unanswered questions, and as humanity continues its voyage of discovery, the enigmatic encounter serves as a constant reminder that the universe is full of surprises, waiting to be discovered. As mentioned, numerous recordings from the International Space Station have captured objects appearing in the frame, exhibiting unconventional flight patterns and unexplained characteristics. Eyewitness accounts and footage reveal sightings of spherical, cylindrical or disc-shaped objects maneuvering near the space station. These objects often exhibit high speeds, abrupt changes in direction, and anomalous behavior that cannot be easily explained by known space debris or natural phenomena. Several explanations have been proposed to account for the mysterious objects caught near the International Space Station. One possibility is the presence of space debris or satellites, which can occasionally pass by the station. However, the distinct flight patterns and behaviors observed in some cases defy the characteristics of typical space debris or known satellite movements. Another explanation involves misidentifications or lens flares caused by light reflections or internal optics within the cameras. Such optical phenomena can create the illusion of objects or anomalies in the recorded footage. However, the consistency of witness reports and the corroboration between different camera angles challenge the notion that all sightings are mere artifacts. The sightings of these mysterious objects have fueled speculation about potential advanced civilizations. Proponents of this hypothesis argue that the peculiar flight patterns and advanced technology displayed by these objects suggest the presence of intelligent life monitoring our planet or interacting with the space station. While this hypothesis is intriguing, it remains speculative, as definitive proof of advanced activity is yet to be established. The complex nature of this phenomenon requires rigorous scientific investigation and analysis of available evidence to ascertain the true nature of these sightings. The realm of outer space has always been shrouded in mystery, and astronauts, as intrepid explorers, are no strangers to encounters with the unknown. Several astronauts have come forward with accounts of mysterious aircrafts. 
Those who believe in this phenomenon have said that if you are going to believe anyone, then you should believe those who've actually been to space. Perhaps the most notable is the testimony of Buzz Aldrin, the second person to walk on the moon. Aldrin has stated that he and his fellow Apollo 11 crew members observed a mysterious object during their journey to the moon, describing it as a cylindrical object moving alongside their spacecraft. Similarly, Edgar Mitchell, the sixth person to walk on the moon as part of the Apollo 14 mission, spoke openly about his belief in advanced life and his conviction that mysterious objects have visited Earth. Mitchell claimed that multiple astronauts have witnessed these objects, but the information has been withheld from the public. In addition to these renowned astronauts, other space explorers, including Gordon Cooper and Story Musgrave, have shared their own encounters with unidentified objects during their missions. Their descriptions often include sightings of bright lights, strange formations, or objects exhibiting rapid acceleration and maneuverability. The testimonies of astronauts hold considerable weight due to their extensive training, scientific backgrounds and credibility within the space exploration community. These individuals are trained observers who have undergone rigorous astronaut selection processes and have extensive knowledge of spacecraft and celestial phenomena. The testimonies of astronauts who claim to have encountered mysterious objects during their space missions provide intriguing insights into the unexplained phenomena that occur beyond our planet. While skeptics offer alternative explanations and caution against misinterpretations, the credibility and training of these astronauts demand careful consideration. The experiences shared by these space explorers encourage scientific inquiry, inspire curiosity, and challenge our understanding of the universe. As we continue to explore the cosmos, further research and investigation into these encounters will shed light on the nature of these objects and potentially reshape our understanding of our place in the universe. Analysis has determined that the objects retrieved are of exotic origin, non-human intelligence, whether extraterrestrial or unknown origin, based on the vehicle morphologies and material science testing. This is the most recent comment from a defense intelligence whistleblower. For those interested in this topic, the last six years have been full of ups and downs in the United States. Leslie Keane and Ralph Blumenthal, who were part of the team that broke the 2017 story, have published a new report that may give hope to those who believe in the existence of advanced beings. According to the report, a defense intelligence whistleblower has claimed that the intelligence community is keeping classified evidence of non-human origin craft that are both fully and partially intact. According to a complaint filed by whistleblower David Charles Grush, the Pentagon, along with other countries and defense contractors, have obtained fragments from unidentified sources that have unique atomic and radiological signatures. Grush also alleges that these fragments have been subjected to material science testing and based on the morphology of the vehicles containing the fragments, it is suggested that the intelligence behind these materials may not be of human origin. He further claims that these materials include both fully and partially intact vehicles. Grush, an Afghanistan combat veteran, served in the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force. This program, managed by the Office of Naval Intelligence, investigates sightings of mysterious aircrafts. As the representative of the National Reconnaissance Office, a top-rated U.S. intelligence agency, Grush participated in the task force from 2019 to 2021. Despite a previous expert in the government being discredited, Grush's evidence are highly regarded by his colleagues. Carl Nell, a retired army colonel who also worked on the task force, described Grush as beyond reproach. Additionally, Grush explained in a claim that other nations are currently competing to identify UFO crashes and landings, along with the materials that are currently being used for exploitation and reverse engineering. According to Nell, a knowledgeable intelligence source, there has been a hidden competition on Earth for the last 80 years to reverse engineer unknown technologies, and this assertion is accurate. Nell also believes that some of these mysterious technologies may come from non-human extraterrestrial intelligence, Another intelligence official, Jonathan Gray, investigating mysterious aircrafts, agrees that there is a genuine non-human intelligence phenomenon, indicating that humans are not alone in the universe. Gray points out that the mysterious aircraft phenomenon is widespread and persistent, but we have not been able to find a global solution to it yet. 
The unclassified complaint disclosed to the debrief alleges that the intelligence community deliberately concealed evidence of extraterrestrial technology from congressional oversight, thus hindering its efficacy. Gregory Grush, the whistleblower who raised these concerns, reportedly faced months of retaliation as a result. To protect the integrity of the ongoing investigation, Grush has not revealed the details of the retaliation. The Pentagon confirmed the report's contents in April, although the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence did not comment. Following his retirement in April, Grush expressed hope that his allegations would trigger an ontological shock. The existence of unidentified objects and their alleged crashes has long intrigued both the general public and those interested in the unknown. Speculation about the United States government's involvement in such incidents has given rise to numerous claims and controversies. Over the years, several crash incidents have been reported. Proponents of the crashed theory argue that these incidents provide tangible evidence of advanced visitation. Claims of other incidents have further fueled the belief that the United States government possesses these objects and that they are keeping this information away from the general public. One of the reasons for doing this is they don't want to admit that there's something out there much more advanced than us, and the reason for this is because it could cause panic. If there are objects out there that can easily outmaneuver our best jets, then it shows that we could easily be overpowered if things didn't go to plan. However, believers have said that if something bad was going to happen, then it would have happened by now. Supporters of the crashed theory often point to eyewitness accounts, leaked documents, and alleged insider testimonials as evidence of the government's involvement. However, critics argue that the lack of concrete evidence, inconsistencies in testimonies, and the possibility of hoaxes cast doubt on the veracity of these claims. Theories regarding these crashed objects often revolve around government secrecy. As mentioned, the assertion is that the United States government has actively suppressed information to maintain control and prevent public panic. The investigation of unidentified objects by the United States government has a storied history that spans several decades. The United States' interest in mysterious aircrafts can be traced back to the 1940s and 1950s. These initiatives aimed to collect and analyze reports of mysterious aircraft sightings with the primary focus on national security concerns. Congressional interest and involvement have played a significant role in shaping the United States' approach to investigations. Several lawmakers have pushed for increased transparency and funding to study these aerial phenomena. In December 2020, the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021 included a provision mandating the preparation of an unclassified report on mysterious aircrafts. In addition to government agencies, the scientific community has become increasingly engaged in the study of these objects. Renowned organizations like the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies and the privately funded To The Stars Academy have worked to bridge the gap between scientific inquiry and public interest, fostering collaboration and the application of rigorous scientific methodologies to investigate these sightings. The United States' investigation of mysterious aircrafts has evolved over time, driven by public interest, technological advancements and national security concerns. From the early military investigations to the contemporary initiatives, the pursuit of understanding these objects continues to capture the attention of government agencies, scientists and the public, forging a path toward unravelling the mysteries of the unknown skies. It's just been announced that evidence of a possible wormhole has opened up at Skinwalker Ranch. Photographs have been shared by the team who are currently investigating Skinwalker Ranch and its anomalies. For those unaware, the Skinwalker Ranch, which is situated in the Uintah Basin in northeastern Utah, is an intriguing location, enveloped in tales and enigmas. It is commonly referred to as Sherman Ranch, and over the years, various individuals have come forward with strange reports, many of whom have detailed strange wormholes opening up in the sky and noting that they witnessed objects flying through them. This 480-acre property is known for its association with various phenomena such as mysterious aircrafts, strange entity encounters, mysterious livestock expirations, patterns formed in crops, and the presence of skinwalkers. Additionally, 
the ranch shares a border with the Ute Indian Reservation. The Ute were granted the Winter Valley Reservation in October 1861 through President Abraham Lincoln's executive order. In January 1882, the Uncompahgre Reservation, also known as the Ore Reservation, was established and later merged with the Winter Reservation in 1886, resulting in the creation of the Winter and Ure Reservation. This reservation has served as the home for the Ute for over 150 years, spanning over four and a half million acres of land. For many years, the indigenous people have spoken about how the neighboring ranch lies on the path of the skinwalker, and as a result, they have been strictly prohibited from approaching the property. The skinwalker refers to a malicious creature who can change shape, and the Ute people regard this figure with great reverence. The Ute tribe inhabited regions such as Utah, Colorado and New Mexico before they relocated to the reservation. They were known for their fierce and warlike nature. In the past, the Ute and Navajo tribes joined forces to resist their shared adversaries. However, when the Ute tribe acquired horses from the Spanish, they started taking Navajo individuals and selling them in markets located in New Mexico. During the Civil War, certain Ute groups joined forces with Kit Carson in a military operation against the Navajo, which resulted in the Navajo being expelled from their territories and compelled to march to the Fort Sumner Reservation in New Mexico, known as the Long Walk of the Navajo. Although the Navajo tribe was eventually allowed to return to their ancestral lands in the Four Corners region, the Ute community held the belief that the Navajo had placed a curse on them for their past offences. As a consequence, the Ute people started experiencing disturbances caused by the skinwalkers. The Ute people have a long-standing belief in the existence of skinwalkers, and these tales have been passed down for over 15 generations. However, they do not hold the belief that skinwalkers reside on the ranch. Instead, they believe that skinwalkers seek refuge in a nearby location known as Dark Canyon. Based on reports, skinwalkers have been frequently observed by the Ute people in the region. These beings have been sighted near the ranch, along the road to Fort Duchesne, and in different parts of the reservation. One description paints them as human-like creatures with dog heads, while others have described them as being more wolf-like. Another account depicts them as big, black, hairy humanoids with remarkable speed. Witnesses have also claimed that these entities possess unusually large and intimidating red eyes. Additionally, there are reports of people encountering and capturing photographs of substantial footprints believed to be left behind by skinwalkers. The Myers family settled on the ranch in 1905. Initially, there were a few small buildings on the northwest corner of the ranch, located at the base of Skinwalker Ridge. Eventually, the original homestead was deserted and a new residence was established on the eastern side of the ranch. From the 1930s until 1987, Kenneth John Myers and his wife Edith Myers resided on the property. Although no unusual incidents were reported by the Myers themselves during their time there, some of their neighbours did have experiences worth noting. During the 1950s, a series of peculiar incidents started happening in the basin. There were multiple accounts of unidentified objects observed above the property, and these sightings persisted for several decades. It is worth noting that this wasn't the initial occurrence of unusual aircraft sightings. The earliest documented mention of such sightings goes back to the late 1700s, when Spanish explorers, who were in search of the Spanish Trail, passed through the basin and reported observing strange crafts hovering above their nightly campfires. The reports of unidentified objects were numerous, with descriptions ranging from fireballs to aircraft of different sizes and shapes, including round, oval, cigar-shaped and triangular. Some of these objects were enveloped in a green glow, while others emitted red beams or displayed coloured lights from underneath. The influx of calls became so overwhelming for the Utah Highway Patrol that by the 1970s, reports were no longer filed. Additionally, local ranchers also reported unusual instances of cattle expirations during the same period. Joseph Hicks, a retired science teacher hailing from Roosevelt, Utah, delved into over 400 reported sightings in the basin and uncovered an intriguing correlation between these sightings and instances of cattle expirations. Throughout his research, Hicks documented numerous accounts from eyewitnesses who claimed to have observed living beings inside these objects through the windows or portholes. 
1994, Terry and Gwen Sherman became the new owners of the ranch that had been left vacant by the Myers since 1987. They were taken aback to discover deadbolt locks on every door and window, both inside and outside the house. The kitchen cabinets were not spared either, as they also had bolts on them. Additionally, iron stakes and heavy chains were found at both ends of the house, presumably used by the previous occupants for their large guard dogs. The Shermans, accompanied by their two children and livestock, decided to make this property their new home. On the day the family moved in, they immediately noticed a sizable coyote, or possibly a wolf, in one of their fields. It swiftly advanced towards a pen where their livestock was kept. It proceeded to seize a young calf by its nose and attempted to pull it through the bars of the enclosure. Terry Sherman and his father attempted to free the calf by striking the animal, but their efforts proved to be unsuccessful. When their initial attempt was unsuccessful, Sherman resorted to firing at the animal with a magnum from close range. However, despite being fired at multiple times, the wolf carried on gripping the calf. Eventually, after a few more shots, the animal let go of the calf and calmly stared at the men. Surprisingly, there were no visible signs of injury on the animal. In an attempt to understand what had happened, the men pursued the animal's footprints for approximately a mile before they abruptly ceased, as if the animal had mysteriously vanished. This incident served as a hint of what was yet to come. A couple of weeks later, while Gwen Sherman was driving in her car, she came across a sizable wolf that had its back aligned with the top of her window. There was also a canine-like creature accompanying the wolf, but she couldn't determine its exact species. Throughout the following two years, the Shermans and their fellow residents witnessed a variety of unusual creatures within their vicinity. These sightings entailed the presence of vibrant, non-indigenous species, as well as towering, mysterious creatures resembling large humanoids. During an incident, the Shermans witnessed an unusual creature, reminiscent of a hyena, engaging in an attack on one of their horses. The creature was described as having a low stature, substantial muscle mass, weighing around 200 pounds, with red curly fur and a tail. When Mr. Sherman approached the animal, it mysteriously disappeared. Later examination of the horse revealed multiple claw marks on its legs. Several months afterward, a neighboring resident reported seeing a comparable creature dashing across their land. The Shermans, just like their fellow residents, also witnessed unusual luminosities and airborne entities, with over 12 sightings occurring on a single night. It was during these encounters with unidentified objects that they also faced the unfortunate demise or vanishing of seven of their finest livestock. Out of these, four vanished completely, while three others were discovered lifeless. Three of the deceased cows displayed an unusual anomaly, a distinctive void in the middle of the left eyeball, while remaining unscathed otherwise. Another bovine specimen had a comparable aperture in its left eye, accompanied by a significant six-inch cavity, approximately an inch in depth, carved into part of its body. The final cow subjected to this act had been observed alive merely five minutes earlier by the Sherman's son. A particular cow among the missing livestock appeared to have mysteriously vanished from the snowy landscape. Its tracks led into a field but abruptly ceased. The ground was scattered with snapped twigs and branches and the tree canopies seemed to have been severed. Throughout this period, a variety of peculiar incidents transpired as well. It was not uncommon for pastures to inexplicably illuminate during the nighttime hours. Furthermore, there were reports of audible sounds resembling the workings of heavy machinery emanating from beneath the ground. Poltergeist-like occurrences, such as objects vanishing only to reappear later, were also observed. Additionally, eerie disembodied voices, frequently communicating in an unfamiliar language, were heard from above. Additionally, peculiar patterns of flattened grass, commonly referred to as crop circles, were discovered on the ranch. In May 1996, Sherman experienced a significant event that served as the breaking point. While outside with his three dogs, he noticed a vibrant blue object swiftly moving in the field nearby. Prompted by curiosity, he encouraged his dogs to chase after it. The dogs energetically pursued the object, expressing their excitement through barks, until they disappeared into a dense thicket. Sherman was alarmed when he heard three distressing yelps from his pets 
and realized they were unresponsive to his calls. The following day, when he ventured out to search for them, all he discovered were three spherical, greasy masses with evidence of scorching. Unfortunately, the dogs were never found again. After experiencing these frightening incidents for a period of two years, the family decided to share their story with the public. The initial reports regarding the bizarre occurrences on the ranch were initially published in the Deseret News in Salt Lake City, Utah, followed by a series of articles by journalist George Knapp in the weekly newspaper Las Vegas Mercury. George Knapp and Colm Kelleher later wrote a book that provides a comprehensive account of previous inquiries conducted in the county area regarding reported sightings, incidents involving missing and expired livestock, sightings of large animals possessing piercing red eyes that were unharmed despite being fired at, unseen objects emitting destructive magnetic fields, formations of crop circles, encounters with creatures resembling Bigfoot, and instances of poltergeist phenomena. The Shermans had intentions to sell the property, but before they could do so, they received an unexpected offer from Robert Bigelow, a wealthy businessman and is the founder of the National Institute for Discovery Science. He became interested in buying the property after learning about the events from a newspaper article. Bigelow acquired the ranch for a sum of $200,000, with the condition that the Shermans would not divulge any further details about the incidents that occurred on the property. Subsequently, he initiated the establishment of a comprehensive facility comprising advanced sensory technology, field investigators with doctorate-level qualifications, scientific experts, and round-the-clock security personnel. A resident in Texas reported seeing a mysterious object in the sky. The eyewitness submitted a report to the Mutual UFO Network, an organization that investigates mysterious aircrafts, and reported that as the sun was setting, they captured some images of patterns that had formed in the clouds. They reported that to ensure the quality of their images, they snapped three shots at once. However, upon reviewing the photos, they were unaware of what they had captured, noting that in the background, a strange black object could be seen close to the clouds. They showed the mysterious object to their wife, but both of them couldn't agree on what this object was, further adding that there wasn't anything in the area at the time the image was taken. The resident explained that the absence of trees where he lives means that there are no birds around and caused him to rule out the possibility that this was an animal. The eyewitness had said that they are looking for an answer as to what this object could be. Interestingly enough, other people came forward and said that they had seen the same thing and detailed that the object could be seen breaking through the clouds. One resident by the name of Mary Thompson had an extraordinary encounter with an object that looked nearly identical to this one. Mary described that as she was walking her dog, she couldn't help but notice the sky above. High above, amidst the backdrop of the fading daylight, she spotted an unusual object moving through the sky. It was a large black object, silently gliding across the horizon. Mary watched the enigmatic craft, captivated by its otherworldly presence. She stood there in awe, unable to comprehend what she was witnessing, noting that the object didn't match anything that she had seen before. The mysterious black object defied all conventional understanding, and she detailed that it moved with such grace and precision. Mary's mind raced with questions, trying to rationalize the inexplicable sight before her eyes. She detailed that she tried to take a photograph of the mysterious object, but noted that her phone's camera wasn't up to the task, and the resulting images were too blurry to make out anything. As Mary continued to watch the mysterious craft, a sense of excitement and curiosity overwhelmed her. After seeing these photographs, she reported that it reminded her of the object that she had seen and said that the black object she witnessed was the same shape as this one. She also detailed that the object appeared to be rotating. The topic of mysterious aircrafts above Texas has captivated the public's imagination for decades, leading to a surge in reported sightings and encounters and causing eyewitnesses to come forward with their encounters. While the nature and origin of these unidentified objects above Texas remain a subject of debate. The number of reported sightings in the United States is quite substantial and has led to researchers into the unknown to say that these sightings and encounters should be taken more seriously. The United States, 
with its vast territory and diverse population, has been a hotspot for unidentified sightings. Over the years, numerous individuals from all walks of life have come forward to share their experiences, ranging from strange lights in the sky to encounters with mysterious craft. And interestingly, due to the amount of encounters that have been reported, it's led to astronauts and military personnel to come forward with their sightings, which many have said adds credibility to these claims. The exact number of reported sightings in the United States varies from year to year. Organizations that research these aircrafts have provided valuable data for analysis and investigation. According to available records, thousands of sightings are reported in the United States annually, and in some years, the numbers reach into the tens of thousands, indicating a significant interest and ongoing fascination with the phenomenon. It is important to note that not all reported sightings can be classified as genuine encounters. Many sightings turn out to have conventional explanations, such as misidentified aircraft, weather phenomena, or even hoaxes. However, a significant percentage of cases remain unexplained, leaving room for speculation and further investigation. Some of the most commonly reported sightings include objects exhibiting unusual flight patterns, high speeds, or abrupt changes in direction. Witnesses often describe seeing bright lights, saucer-shaped craft, or triangular formations in the sky. Some reports even describe close encounters with beings or entities associated with these unidentified objects. The Lone Star State of Texas, with its vast landscapes and diverse population, has been a hotspot for sightings and encounters. Over the years, numerous reports have emerged from various regions, captivating the imagination of residents and sparking curiosity among enthusiasts. One of the most famous incidents in Texas occurred in 1957 in the small town of Leveland. Multiple witnesses reported seeing a large, egg-shaped object with bright lights that allegedly caused their vehicles to stall or malfunction. The incident gained significant media attention, drawing the interest of researchers and investigators from around the country. In addition to the Leveland incident, Texas has been the site of numerous other reported sightings. Witnesses have described a wide range of phenomena, including sightings of disc-shaped objects, triangular craft, and mysterious lights in the night sky. Over the years, numerous residents reported seeing a massive, silent object with flashing lights moving at high speeds. The incident gained national attention and prompted investigations by both local authorities and researchers. Reports of sightings in Texas often involve witnesses from different backgrounds, including military personnel, law enforcement officers, and everyday citizens. Many sightings occur in rural areas where the night sky is free from light pollution, allowing for clearer observations of unusual aerial phenomena. The Gulf Coast region of Texas has also seen its fair share of sightings. The proximity to the Gulf of Mexico and the area's extensive waterways have led to reports of unidentified objects emerging from or descending into the water. Witnesses have described bright lights or strange craft performing unusual maneuvers in the sky before disappearing without a trace. The advent of modern technology and the widespread use of smartphones have made it easier than ever for individuals to document and share their sightings. Photos and videos captured by eyewitnesses can provide valuable visual evidence although their authenticity and reliability must be carefully evaluated. While the number of reported sightings is significant, it is important to consider that not all sightings are reported. Many witnesses choose not to come forward due to fear of ridicule or skepticism. Therefore, the actual number of encounters may be much higher than the reported figures. Tom DeLong has transitioned from the world of music to an entirely different domain investigating unidentified objects. DeLong's fascination with unidentified objects and the possibility of advanced life began in his childhood. But it wasn't until he left music in 2015 that he began to devote his full attention to this interest. He co-founded To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science, a research group committed to exploring the outer edges of science and unexplained phenomena. To the STARS Academy of Arts and Science has made significant strides in unidentified object research, largely through the acquisition and public release of military footage of mysterious encounters. This footage has played a critical role in reinvigorating public discussion about unidentified aircrafts and pushing for more transparency from government agencies. Notably, 
Some of the footage released by To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science has been officially confirmed by the Pentagon as depicting unexplained aerial phenomena. A few hours ago, Tom came forward and said that advanced beings that have allegedly been witnessed by people are real, but noted that they come from time, hinting that they could be time travelers. Interestingly, this isn't the first time that this theory has been put forward. One particularly captivating concept is the idea that unidentified objects may be time machines, vessels from our future navigating the currents of time. The concept of time travel has long been a staple of science fiction, but it also has roots in established physics. The general theory of relativity, formulated by Albert Einstein, allows for the possibility of warped space-time structures, known as wormholes, which could theoretically enable faster-than-light travel, or even journeys through time. Some proponents of the time-traveling UFO theory posit that these unknown crafts could be utilizing such advanced technology. If unidentified objects are indeed time machines, it could offer an alternative explanation for their seemingly advanced capabilities. Their ability to accelerate instantly, move at incredible speeds, or change direction abruptly, which defy our current understanding of physics and aerodynamics, could be attributes of time manipulation or of technology far advanced beyond our own, perhaps even from our own future. Under this theory, these sightings become not instances of advanced encounters, but glimpses of humanity's future or humans from the future traveling to this timeline. The beings operating these crafts might not be entities from other planets, but post-human entities or artificial intelligences from a time far ahead of ours. They may be engaged in a form of chronotourism, visiting key moments in their past for research, observation or some unfathomable reason. The prospect of time-traveling objects also provides a potential answer to the Fermi paradox, the apparent contradiction between high estimates of extraterrestrial life and the lack of contact or evidence for such civilizations. If mysterious aircrafts are time travelers, rather than advanced beings, it may explain why we've yet to find definitive proof of alien life. Our main encounters have been with entities from our own timeline, albeit from the future. However, while intriguing, this theory remains largely speculative. The science of time travel is still theoretical, with wormholes, if they exist, likely unstable without exotic matter we've yet to discover. The theory also fails to explain why these future beings or machines choose to reveal themselves sporadically, yet never make definitive contact. Furthermore, skeptics argue this theory falls into the trap of temporal chauvinism. The belief that our era, in the vast timeline of the universe, is significant enough to warrant visits from the future. Given that Earth is over 4.5 billion years old, and human civilization just a fraction of that, what makes our time so interesting to these alleged time travelers? As of right now, the theory put forward by Tom DeLong of time-traveling unidentified objects is an intriguing notion that stirs the imagination and challenges our understanding of the universe. However, it also underscores our limited knowledge of both the phenomena and the nature of time itself. To the STARS Academy of Arts and Science also employs a team of experienced professionals from diverse fields, including government officials, scientists, and former intelligence officers. This multidisciplinary approach has allowed the group to investigate mysterious phenomena from various angles, incorporating scientific analysis, technological innovation, and policy advocacy. D. Long himself has played a crucial role in raising public awareness about mysterious aircrafts, leveraging his celebrity status to bring the topic into mainstream discourse. He has engaged in numerous public speaking engagements and interviews, elucidating his views on the subject and promoting the work of To The Stars Academy. His efforts were recognized in 2017 when he was awarded the Unidentified Object Researcher of the Year by Open Minds, a news and research organization. However, DeLong's approach to these investigations has not been without criticism. Some skeptics argue that his views lean too heavily into theory territory and question the scientific rigor of To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science investigations. Furthermore, the commercial aspect of To The Stars Academy, which sells merchandise and seeks to develop entertainment content related to unidentified objects, has also raised eyebrows about the organization's motives. Regardless of the criticisms, 
It's undeniable that De Long has contributed significantly to the ongoing conversation about mysterious aircrafts. His efforts, particularly through to the STARS Academy of Arts and Science, have brought renewed attention to the topic and prompted a broader push for official transparency on mysterious encounters. Whether one aligns with his views or not, his commitment to investigating the mysteries of our universe is a testament to human curiosity and the desire for understanding. Time travel, a concept deeply embedded in the realms of science fiction and fantasy, continues to captivate the human imagination. While the idea seems far-fetched and outside the domain of reality, certain theories in physics suggest it could be within the realms of possibility. Firstly, we must understand that time, according to Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, is not a constant entity, but rather intertwined with space, forming the fabric of space-time. This theory suggests that the presence of mass or energy can distort space-time, leading to the phenomena we know as gravity. Therefore, the concept of manipulating space-time underpins any discussion of time travel. One of the most popular theories for potential time travel involves wormholes, a solution to Einstein's field equations. Wormholes are shortcuts through space-time, connecting distant points in the universe. If stable wormholes exist, traversing through them could theoretically allow for travel to faraway regions of space or even different points in time. However, the existence and stability of wormholes are speculative and remain unproven. Even if they do exist, creating or finding a wormhole that leads to a specific time and place and safely traveling through it presents enormous challenges. Another concept related to time travel is time dilation, a proven effect of both special and general relativity. This effect states that time passes at different rates for objects moving relative to one another or positioned in different gravitational fields. The classic twin paradox thought experiment illustrates this, where one twin travels near the speed of light in a spaceship and upon returning to Earth finds the other twin has aged more. However, while this allows for forward time travel, it provides no known method for traveling backward in time. Perhaps the most contentious and speculative theory of time travel involves the idea of cosmic strings, hypothetical one-dimensional defects in the universe. Cosmic strings, if they exist, would warp space-time around them. Some scientists have speculated that if two such strings were to pass by each other, a loop of space-time could be created, potentially allowing for a path to the past. However, the existence of cosmic strings is purely theoretical, and even if they do exist, the practicality of manipulating them for time travel is doubtful. Despite these intriguing possibilities, there are significant paradoxes and problems associated with time travel, notably the grandfather paradox, in which a person traveling back in time could theoretically prevent their own existence, creating a contradiction. Quantum mechanics offers a potential solution via the many worlds interpretation, where each event spawns a new universe, but this interpretation is not universally accepted. When we gaze at the night sky, we cannot help but wonder whether we are alone in the universe or if there are other advanced civilizations out there. The Drake Equation, proposed by astrophysicist Frank Drake in 1961, considers various factors to calculate the potential number of advanced civilizations. These factors include the rate of star formation, the fraction of those stars that have planetary systems, the number of planets that could potentially support life, the fraction of planets where life actually develops, the proportion of life that evolves into intelligent beings, the fraction of civilizations that develop technology that releases detectable signs into space, and the length of time such civilizations release detectable signals. Since the formulation of the Drake equation, our understanding of these parameters has improved, albeit with significant uncertainty. For instance, the Kepler Space Telescope's observations suggest that there could be billions of Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone. However, other factors like the fraction of planets where life actually emerges, or how many life forms evolve into intelligent beings are still largely speculative. Consider an optimistic scenario, where life is relatively common, and a significant fraction of life evolves into intelligent beings. In that case, the Milky Way alone could potentially host thousands or even millions of advanced civilizations. Extend this reasoning to the entire observable universe, which contains an estimated two trillion galaxies, and the number of advanced civilizations could be incredibly vast. However, this optimism is tempered by the Fermi paradox, 
which highlights the contradiction between high estimates of extraterrestrial civilizations and the lack of contact or evidence for such civilizations. One potential resolution to this paradox is the Great Filter Hypothesis, which suggests that at some point from pre-life to a Type III civilization, a civilization that can harness all the energy of its galaxy, there's a wall that all, or nearly all, attempts at life hit. On the more pessimistic side, life may be exceedingly rare or unique to Earth, or intelligent life and advanced civilizations may be short-lived and thus less likely to overlap in time and space. In this case, the number of advanced civilizations in the universe could be extremely small or even zero. One of the most intriguing possibilities proposed by theoretical physics is the concept of wormholes, shortcuts through the fabric of space-time. While we have yet to observe or create a wormhole, they remain plausible solutions to Einstein's equations of general relativity. If a civilization possessed the technological prowess to create and stabilize a wormhole, it could potentially provide instant travel between two distant points in the universe. This would effectively bypass the constraints of light-speed travel, allowing rapid exploration or colonization of far-flung star systems. The ability to manipulate wormholes could also open up possibilities for time travel, as the two mouths of a wormhole could, theoretically, be connected to different points in time. Such a civilization would have to overcome the tremendous hurdle of stabilizing a wormhole. It has been suggested that a form of exotic matter, possessing negative energy or pressure, might be necessary to prevent a wormhole from collapsing. Antarctica, the southernmost and arguably the most mysterious continent on Earth, has a relatively short but compelling history of exploration. Unlike other continents, its extreme weather conditions and remoteness have historically made it inaccessible to humans. However, this very inaccessibility has lured intrepid explorers, each seeking to uncover the mysteries of this frozen landscape. The turn of the 20th century marked the beginning of what is commonly referred to as the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. This period saw various expeditions striving to reach the South Pole, a feat first achieved by Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen and his team in December 1911. Yet, numerous accounts over the years suggest that Antarctica may not be as devoid of activity as one might assume. The Mysterious Flight of Admiral Richard E. Byrd In 1947, the United States Navy's Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd embarked on a direct flight to the North Pole. While some speculate that his plane merely crossed over the pole, others believe that it actually ventured into the Earth. According to Byrd's diary, he recounts his journey into the cavernous depths of the Earth's interior, where he traversed 1,700 miles across mountains, lakes, rivers, lush vegetation, and encountered various forms of wildlife. Richard Byrd, an American naval officer born in 1888, dedicated his career to exploration and conducting expeditions in uncharted territories. Primarily known for his expertise in polar exploration, Admiral Byrd acted as a navigator on various flights that ventured into the Arctic, North Pole, Antarctica, and South Pole. Notably, during his initial flight over the North Pole, Byrd asserted that he encountered a passage leading to Agatha, a fabled city believed to be located at the Earth's core. After graduating from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1912, Byrd was commissioned an ensign in the U.S. Navy. He learned flying at the U.S. Naval Air Station, Pensacola, Florida, and served in the Navy with distinction. After the war, he developed navigational methods and equipment for NC flying boats, one of which made the Navy's first transatlantic airplane flight in 1919. He also assisted with dirigibles built for transatlantic crossings. His polar career began in 1924, when he had command of a small naval aviation detachment with Commander D.B. McMillan's Arctic expedition to Western Greenland, based at Etar. Byrd, inspired by his experience of flying over sea ice and glaciers in Western Greenland, was determined to fly over the North Pole. On May 9, 1926, Byrd, acting as the navigator, and Floyd Bennett as the pilot, claimed to have made the first airplane journey to the North Pole, flying from Kings Bay, Spitsbergen, Norway, and back. The flight lasted 15 and a half hours, with the only issue being an oil leak from the starboard engine of their Fokker trimotor airplane. Their achievement led them to be honored with the U.S. Congressional Medal of Honor, 
and hailed as national heroes. However, there was always some doubt surrounding whether they had truly reached the North Pole. Bernd Balschen, one of Bird's early associates, even alleged that the flight to the North Pole was a hoax after Bird's passing. In May 1927, Bird provided navigational training and assisted Charles A. Lindbergh, an American aviator, in his solo transatlantic flight. Bird was instrumental in preparing Lindbergh for the journey and ensuring he had access to a specially extended runway. Inspired by Lindbergh's feat, Bird and three companions decided to attempt their own west-to-east flight across the Atlantic. During Bird's initial exploration of Antarctica, from 1928 to 1930, an extensive and well-provisioned base called Little America was established on the Ross Ice Shelf near the Ross Sea. This expedition, which was the largest and most well-equipped at the time, embarked on flights over the Antarctic continent. They discovered the Rockefeller Mountains, a mountain range, and named the uncharted territory beyond it Marie Birdland after Bird's wife. The most interesting story surrounding the Admiral is that he allegedly flew into the earth. In 1947, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, a member of the United States Navy, made a flight to the North Pole. There are speculations that rather than simply passing over the pole, his aircraft might have actually entered the inner earth. According to entries in his diary, he describes his journey into the interior of the earth, covering a distance of 1,700 miles over landscapes of mountains, lakes, rivers, green vegetation and wildlife. In this journal, the story unfolds with the arrival of unknown aircrafts to greet the esteemed aviator. These flying machines were unfamiliar to him, indicating that he had encountered something completely new. They informed him that he had been permitted to enter Agatha, the renowned city located within the Earth's interior, due to his exemplary moral and ethical values. The decision was made by these beings to establish deeper connections with the external world, aiming to safeguard our planet to prevent its destruction along with their own civilization. Admiral Byrd and his crew were escorted by their guides in their aircraft back to civilization, their existence forever transformed. Admiral Byrd claimed that the North and South Poles are just two out of numerous entrances leading to the inner core of our planet. According to Admiral Byrd, the inner Earth is said to possess its own internal sun, a concept shared by previous scientists. Contrary to the conventional belief of concave poles, it is theorized that the Earth's poles are actually convex. This would suggest the existence of openings that ships and planes could potentially navigate through, whether floating or flying. Those who believe this story said that the findings of Admiral Byrd were covered by the American media, but it was quickly concealed by a secretive global plot, orchestrated by our well-intentioned officials. Ray Palmer, the editor of the renowned publication Flying Saucer magazine, wrote an elaborate article about Admiral Byrd's findings. According to reports, the US government acquired, confiscated, or eradicated nearly all copies of the article and subsequently destroyed the printing press plates. To believe that such a cover-up could not be orchestrated is a display of naivety. The incident of an article discussing Admiral Byrd's discovery, published in National Geographic, experienced a remarkably similar occurrence. Following the publication, the US authorities diligently sought out and eliminated nearly all copies of that particular edition. This raises an intriguing question. If the account of Agatha was indeed unfounded, then why would the government feel such intense apprehension regarding the dissemination of this information? The mysterious, unidentified objects found embedded within the ice. The frozen wilderness of Antarctica, barren and largely unexplored, has long been the cradle of countless mysteries and speculations. Among the most intriguing of these enigmas is the alleged sightings and subsequent discoveries of unidentified objects embedded within its thick ice. Despite the inhospitable conditions, various reports over the years have indicated strange activities in this region. Witnesses, primarily composed of military personnel and scientific researchers stationed in the area, have reported unusual aerial phenomena, including glowing orbs, disc-like objects, and fast-moving lights that defy conventional explanations. These sightings, coupled with subsequent physical evidence such as inexplicable indentations in the ice and abnormal radiation readings, have sparked speculation about an advanced presence in Antarctica. However, 
These mysterious objects in Antarctica are not just about sightings. Reports of crashed objects frozen within the ice have also surfaced. One of the most famous incidents dates back to the 1960s, when an alleged satellite image depicted what appeared to be a metallic object, roughly two miles across, embedded in the ice of East Antarctica. Although the image's authenticity has been challenged, the object's size and shape spurred theories that it could be an advanced spacecraft. Critics argue that the harsh Antarctic conditions and the human mind's tendency to identify patterns, known as pareidolia, can make one mistake naturally occurring ice formations or meteorological phenomena for unidentified objects. However, the proponents of the theory claim that the object's advanced technology and the secrecy surrounding Antarctic operations suggest an advanced origin. Further fuel to these speculations was added in the late 20th century, when governments worldwide started showing increased interest in Antarctica. Several countries established research bases, and even the Vatican set up an observatory. This sudden interest in such a hostile region, along with classified expeditions like the United States Operation High Jump, has led to theories that these governments might be aware of mysterious activity in the area. The secrecy surrounding these expeditions, coupled with declassified FBI documents referring to recovered flying saucers, further intensified the debate. However, due to the extreme weather conditions and the Antarctic Treaty System, which limits military activity and prohibits mineral mining in Antarctica, independent verification of these claims is challenging, leaving these accounts as yet unconfirmed. Moreover, in recent years, the debate on the mysterious Antarctic objects has taken on a new dimension with the advent of melting ice. The melting polar ice caps could potentially expose these hidden objects, forcing governments to disclose information about these alleged visitors. This possibility has excited enthusiasts worldwide, who believe that this could finally provide indisputable proof of advanced life. Its harsh environment and relative isolation make it a seemingly unlikely location for unidentified object sightings. Yet, numerous accounts over the years suggest that the desolate skies above Antarctica may not be as devoid of activity as one might assume. During early research into the area, explorers and research teams reported sightings of unexplained luminous objects and strange, fast-moving lights in the sky, phenomena that couldn't be easily dismissed as mere meteorological events or optical illusions. During the mid-20th century, during the International Geophysical Year, an unprecedented international scientific effort focused on the polar regions, there were additional sightings. The most common descriptions were of glowing orbs or disc-shaped objects moving at incredible speeds and performing maneuvers that defied then-known laws of physics. These sightings, often corroborated by multiple witnesses and occasionally captured on film or radar, have been the subject of much speculation and debate. One particularly well-documented instance occurred during the British Antarctic Survey of the late 1960s, an entire team reported a series of mysterious lights over their research station, describing them as glowing red objects hovering in the sky. While skeptics suggest that these sightings can be attributed to atmospheric phenomena like auroras or rare cloud formations, the consistent descriptions across disparate witness accounts suggest something potentially more complex at play. In more recent years, advances in satellite imagery have led to further speculation about possible activity in Antarctica. Images showing seemingly unnatural and anomalous structures or objects have sparked debates about the existence of secret bases or crashed aircrafts. However, definitive proof remains elusive, and these findings often face criticism due to image resolution issues. The veil of secrecy that shrouds operations in Antarctica, due to its strategic importance and the presence of various national research stations, has only added fuel to these speculations. As mentioned, classified missions like the US's Operation High Jump in the late 1940s, are frequently cited in theories alleging government knowledge or even cooperation with crashed aircrafts. Despite this, the scientific community largely remains skeptical of these reports, citing a lack of solid evidence. Critics argue that the isolated, high-stress environment of Antarctica, coupled with the continent's unique atmospheric and light conditions, can lead to misinterpretations of natural phenomena. However, as our technological capability advances and the access to Antarctica becomes increasingly democratized, the opportunity for gathering more comprehensive data grows. Until then, 
The enigmatic sightings over the frozen expanse of Antarctica will continue to mystify and tantalize both believers and skeptics alike, standing as a testament to the enduring human fascination with the possibility of life beyond our own planet. The Alleged Pyramids of Antarctica In 2016, the internet was buzzing with excitement over Google Earth pictures of Antarctica, which seemed to depict pyramid-like structures amidst the icy terrain. These structures bear a striking resemblance to the iconic Giza pyramids found in Egypt. The question that arises is whether these pyramids in Antarctica are truly the work of an ancient civilization. The origin of these pyramids has been a subject of various theories. Among the more contentious proposals are the notions that they could have been remains left by an ancient civilization called Atlantis in Antarctica, or that they were constructed by beings from outer space. Some experts in the field have put forward a geological interpretation for the pyramids found in Antarctica. According to these scientists, it is possible that these structures are not actual pyramids, but rather nunataks. Nunataks are mountain peaks that emerge from below the ice and stand taller than the surrounding landscape. The Antarctica pyramids consist of two structures that are situated approximately 10 miles, or 16 kilometers away from the coastline. The third pyramid is positioned in close proximity to the shoreline. The unearthing of these structures in Antarctica implies that humans may have occupied the region several thousand years ago. This discovery aligns with the era when pyramids were constructed in other parts of the world. The research conducted by Charles Hapgood provides evidence for the potential existence of an ancient civilization on a landmass that is presently engulfed by ice. Dr. Charles Hapgood's publication Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings featured the Piri race map of Antarctica, causing a global sensation during the 16th century. The remarkable aspect of this map was its depiction of Antarctica devoid of ice. The Piri race map was found in Turkey. A Turkish naval officer sent the map to the US Navy Hydrographic Bureau in 1953. M.I. Walters, the chief engineer of the bureau, sent the map to Arlington H. Mallory to be evaluated. Mallory determined that the Piri Rice map was completely accurate and may have been copied from a map made 6,000 years ago. The Piri Rice map of Antarctica has proven to be highly precise. Through the utilization of seismic soundings and sonar technology, scientists have discovered that the geographical features outlined on the map, including coastlines, mountain ranges and plateaus, correspond remarkably well with the actual Queen Maud land in Antarctica. In fact, Olmeyer, the leader of the British-Swedish expedition to Antarctica, even wrote a letter to Hapgood, expressing his astonishment at the map's accuracy. Dear Professor Hapgood, Your request of evaluation of certain unusual features of the Piri Race Antarctica map of 1513 by this organization has been reviewed. The claim that the lower part of the map portrays the Princess Martha coast of Queen Maud Land, Antarctic, and the Palmer Peninsula is reasonable. We find that this is the most logical and, in all probability, the correct interpretation of the map. The geographical detail shown in the lower part of the map agrees very remarkably with the results of the seismic profile made across the top of the ice cap by the Swedish-British Antarctic Expedition of 1949. This indicates the coastline had been mapped before it was covered by the ice cap. The ice cap in this region is now about a mile thick. We have no idea how the data on this map can be reconciled with the supposed state of geographical knowledge in 1513. Harold Z. Olmeyer, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Air Force Commander. Did an ancient civilization once live in Antarctica? The idea of an ancient civilization in Antarctica, the world's coldest, windiest and most remote continent, might seem improbable, even absurd. However, we will attempt to explore this theory from a purely speculative standpoint, looking at the conditions necessary for such a civilization and the possible reasons why evidence of its existence may remain elusive. Firstly, we must consider the geological history of Antarctica. For much of Earth's history, Antarctica was not the ice-encrusted landmass we know today. Approximately 170 million years ago, during the Jurassic period, Antarctica was part of the supercontinent Gondwana, enjoying a much warmer climate and abundant plant life. It was not until around 15 million years ago that Antarctica's current icy state started forming. If we were to speculate about an ancient human civilization, it would need to have existed during a period when Antarctica's climate was more habitable. 
In the context of human evolution, Homo sapiens have only been around for approximately 300,000 years, although it's important to note that our human history is constantly being pushed back with new findings. For an advanced civilization to exist in Antarctica, this would need to have occurred in a geologically short window of time, when both humans existed and Antarctica was free from extensive ice coverage. However, mainstream archaeological and evolutionary consensus suggest this is extremely unlikely. Nonetheless, for the purpose of this thought experiment, let's say that a band of early Homo sapiens, for reasons unknown, made the extraordinary journey to Antarctica and managed to survive. What would have been necessary for them to build an advanced civilization? Firstly, the availability of food and fresh water would have been essential. We can postulate that a hypothetically ice-free Antarctica could have been home to a range of wildlife, much like any other continent, providing ample hunting opportunities. Fresh water could come from rivers and lakes. Secondly, the development of agriculture is often seen as a prerequisite for the emergence of advanced civilizations. The hypothetical inhabitants of ancient Antarctica would have needed to master the cultivation of local plants, creating a stable food supply that would allow the population to grow and create settlements. The creation of tools, the discovery of fire, the invention of the wheel, and the development of written language are all milestones that mark the emergence of advanced civilizations. These discoveries would have also been necessary for our theoretical Antarctic civilization, providing the means for technological advancement, communication, and the recording of history. However, one significant question arises. If an advanced civilization did exist in Antarctica, why haven't we found any evidence? One possibility is that the evidence is buried beneath the continent's massive ice sheets, inaccessible to modern archaeological efforts. Alternatively, any physical evidence of such a civilization might have been eroded or destroyed by the very processes that transformed Antarctica into the icy wilderness we see today. From a scientific standpoint, the likelihood of an advanced human civilization ever having existed in Antarctica is incredibly low. The timeline of human evolution, geological changes, and the lack of archaeological evidence do not support this hypothesis. Nevertheless, it presents a fascinating thought experiment that challenges our understanding of human history and the dynamism of our planet. This theory also highlights the vast and still largely untapped potential for discovery that lies within Antarctica. Despite its inhospitable conditions, the continent holds the keys to understanding Earth's past climate and potentially our future in the face of global change. Who knows what secrets lie beneath its ice, waiting to be uncovered. As of right now, the concept of an ancient civilization in Antarctica is an intriguing theory that captures the imagination. As we continue to explore and study Antarctica, we may yet uncover secrets that challenge our perceptions of what is possible. The Wild West Era, a period of American history spanning the late 18th to the early 20th century, continues to captivate our imagination and interest. This era was marked by cowboys, outlaws, pioneers, and the vast untamed frontier. The Wild West Era, represents a time of unbridled adventure and exploration. It was a time when people pushed the boundaries of known civilization and ventured into the unknown. The promise of new opportunities, undiscovered territories, and the thrill of the open frontier fueled a sense of adventure that still resonates with us. Beyond the iconic cowboy imagery and tales of outlaws, this era is riddled with mysteries that continue to captivate our curiosity. The Mystery of the River Lizards In the early days of January 2000, Ron Schaffner, a highly experienced researcher from the United States, received an email that caught his attention. The sender, who went by the name Derek, used a non-specific and generic email address, which initially raised Schaffner's curiosity. However, the information contained within the email caught his attention. In continuation of that intriguing introduction, Derek proceeded directly to the main point, recounting his remarkable encounter with what can be considered one of the enigmatic mini-dinosaurs that reside in this particular area. According to his account, during an excursion with a friend on his dirt bike near the Fountain River, in close proximity to Pueblo in July of 1998, 
They were suddenly astounded by the sight of a truly extraordinary creature, walking on two feet, swiftly darting across the open expanse right in front of them. Derek's narrative left no room for doubt regarding the exceptional nature of the bipedal being he and his friend witnessed that day. Derek and his companion promptly returned to Derek's residence to retrieve a camera. They then revisited the site of their encounter in order to capture photographic evidence of the peculiar creature's tracks. As their investigation unfolded, Derek learned of other sightings and serendipitously discovered that a friend had actually managed to photograph a similar creature. After some persuasion, Derek's friend granted him permission to share scans of those photos, along with his own track pictures and a detailed account of the July 1998 sighting with Ron. Ron, being well connected in the field of cryptozoology, promptly showed them to his fellow American cryptozoologist Chad Arment, who specializes in American mystery reptiles. Despite their efforts, when the photos were closely examined, even after magnification, Ron and Chad concurred that the subjects captured in the images could easily be mistaken for dinosaur models due to the lack of discernible details. However, despite his initial skepticism, Chad maintained a sufficient level of interest to reach out to Derek via email. In his message, he expressed the need for more compelling evidence to substantiate the existence of these extraordinary creatures. Intriguingly, this exchange between Chad and Derek showcases Chad's lingering curiosity despite his doubts. In relation to the animal depicted in this photograph, which Derek referred to as a river lizard, Derek mentioned that it took him quite some time to acquire scans of the creature. Unfortunately, he did not provide specific details regarding the time or exact location where the photo was taken, only mentioning it was captured somewhere in Colorado. The uniqueness of this creature's appearance raises questions, as it does not match any known species documented by the scientific community. Chad has recently come across information suggesting that the term river dinosaur has been used to describe creatures similar to the one pictured. The photograph of the river lizard provided by Derek has circulated online for numerous years and has sparked significant attention and generated numerous comments on various websites where it has been shared. The general consensus seems to lean towards it being a hoax, although there is no concrete confirmation of this. Despite conducting multiple Google image searches using different approaches, such as focusing on the entire image, the section with the person and the section with the creature, no relevant results have been found. However, the photograph does exhibit some peculiar elements, particularly in relation to the creature's appearance, as pointed out by Chad in an account detailing this and other sightings of bipedal dinosaurs reported in the United States. While the photograph continues to generate debate and speculation, it is crucial to note that the authenticity of the image remains unverified. During a trip to Arizona, a couple had an extraordinary encounter with what could only be described as a river dino. This remarkable sighting left them in awe as they stumbled upon the lifeless body of a reptile that was like nothing they had ever laid eyes on before. According to Suchik, who accompanied them on the expedition, the creature appeared so surreal that it resembled a mere plaything. This captivating incident not only fascinated the couple, but also sparked curiosity among those who heard their account as it unveiled a mysterious creature from the depths of the river. In the early months of 1996, a resident of the Mesa Verde region in Colorado had a rather extraordinary encounter. This individual witnessed a creature that was unlike anything she had ever come across before. In her own words, she described it as standing at a height of about three and a half feet. It moved with such remarkable speed that it was difficult to track, and she added that it seemed to have only two legs, which appeared to provide it with a sense of balance during its swift movements. What made this creature even more intriguing was its unique physical appearance. It possessed a snout in the shape of a cone, protruding from its head, giving it a rather distinct and unusual look. Furthermore, it boasted a lengthy tail that measured around two feet in length. Upon encountering this remarkable creature, the witness sought the expertise of Jeff Thulin, a renowned authority on reptiles from the Reptile Reserve. It turned out that Thulin had heard similar reports from others in the past, further adding to the mystique surrounding this enigmatic creature. After carefully examining the description provided, Thulin admitted that he couldn't identify any known species that would match such a description. 
During their journey through the Yellow Jacket area of Colorado in 2001, a mother and daughter made a remarkable observation that intrigued their imagination. They reported encountering a peculiar creature that possessed distinctive avian attributes, intertwined with a reptilian essence. According to their detailed account, this enigmatic being exhibited a lengthy neck, reminiscent of a bird's anatomy, accompanied by slender legs. However, it was peculiarly devoid of feathers, and its appendages, often referred to as arms, seemed to arise directly from its upright neck rather than its torso. Having carefully scrutinized this mysterious creature, the witnesses estimated its overall length to be approximately five feet, extending from its elongated neck to its tail. Their vivid description offers a captivating insight into a creature that defies conventional categorization, eluding an easy classification as either a bird or a dinosaur. Cowboys and Aliens In 1896, an intriguing incident occurred in Lodi, California, involving two individuals, Colonel H.G. Shaw and Camille Spooner. While journeying from the quaint town of Lodi to the Fresno Citrus Fair, they found themselves encountering a group of three extraordinary beings who appeared to be anything but human. These otherworldly entities stood tall at an impressive height of seven feet and possessed a remarkably slender physique. The incident they reported was an attempted abduction by these enigmatic strangers. This peculiar encounter not only piqued curiosity, but also raised questions about the existence of beings from beyond our known realm. In a report by news outlets, it is mentioned that Colonel Shaw, who is known for his previous role as an editor at the Mail, along with a young individual named Camille Spooner, were making their way back from Lodi in a horse-drawn buggy. The journey took place during nighttime, adding an element of darkness to the scene. According to Shaw, while they were peacefully jogging, the horse abruptly halted in its tracks and emitted a frightened snort, clearly indicating its state of terror. As they directed their gazes upwards, an astonishing sight greeted them, three peculiar individuals. While bearing some resemblance to humans, there was an undeniable uniqueness about them that set them apart from anything they had previously encountered. Standing at an impressive height of nearly, or perhaps exactly seven feet, these beings possessed an extraordinary slenderness that further contributed to their distinctive appearance and aura. In regards to these peculiar entities observed by Shaw, they were not adorned with any type of clothing. Rather, they had a peculiar bodily covering that is somewhat challenging to describe accurately. This covering was neither akin to hair nor feathers, but possessed a remarkably soft texture akin to the gentle touch of silk. Shaw had an intuitive feeling that the unfamiliar individuals he encountered posed no threat. Their curiosity extended not only to Shaw and his companions, but also to the horse and buggy, prompting them to examine every aspect with meticulous attention. Shaw approached them. According to Shaw, the individuals in question had hairless faces and heads, with small ears and noses that resembled polished ivory. It is worth noting that their mouths were remarkably tiny, in stark contrast to their large and radiant eyes. This description paints a vivid picture of their physical characteristics, highlighting the absence of hair and the intriguing features of their facial structure. According to Shaw, he noted that the individuals in question possessed a unique and ineffable attractiveness that defied proper description. As an individual with an ingrained inclination for journalism, Shaw exhibits his characteristic curiosity by questioning the mysterious beings about their origins. However, it appeared that the entities struggled to comprehend his inquiry, resorting to making peculiar warbling sounds instead of engaging in conventional conversation. Shaw then touched one, and said that with his hand placed underneath his elbow, he applied a gentle upward pressure, and much to his astonishment, he effortlessly raised him off the ground. Considering the weightlessness of the being, he would estimate its specific gravity to be less than that of an ounce. This intriguing encounter showcased the remarkable ease with which he was able to lift the creature, an experience that left him pondering the extraordinary properties that defied conventional gravitational forces. Each being bore a satchel, gracefully affixed to a cylindrical projection. Periodically, either of them would bring the projection to their lips, and during this time, a distinct sound of released gas reached their ears. The two visitors from beyond our celestial sphere habitually carried a container connected to a conduit, reminiscent of a shoulder bag. 
This particular moment marked the point where Stockton made its entry into the historical records of stories recounting alleged encounters with advanced beings. Shaw recounted his encounter with a group of individuals, and he detailed how one of them, acting as the apparent leader, made a signal. This signal prompted one of the group members to make an attempt to physically lift Shaw, presumably with the intention of taking him away. The beings, despite their best efforts, were unable to succeed in their endeavor. Even though Shaw offered no resistance whatsoever, they were incapable of budging him from his position. In a final attempt, all three of them joined forces, but their efforts were met with complete and utter failure. Unveiling egg-shaped lights that emitted a soft glow, the entities showcased an extraordinary phenomenon, a colossal airship suspended in the air. The lights, resembling luminous minerals of unknown origin, illuminated the area. The object measured, to the very minimum, a span of 150 feet, though it is unlikely that its diameter exceeded 20 feet. It exhibited a characteristic pointed shape at both ends, lacking any visible machinery except for a prominent rudder located on the outer surface. As they embarked upon the ship, their movement differed from the way we commonly walk. Instead, their strides bore a gracefully swaying motion, with their feet making contact with the ground only at intervals of approximately 15 feet. The beings effortlessly propelled themselves 20 feet into the air, landing gracefully on the ship's deck. Their movement through the atmosphere showcased both speed and agility, as they rapidly expanded and contracted their bodies with a remarkably coordinated muscular motion. According to Shaw, he holds a theory, which he acknowledges is purely speculative, that the individuals we observed were actually inhabitants of Mars. He proposes that they have been sent to Earth with the specific objective of acquiring one of its residents. This notion entails a comprehensive exploration into the concept of extraterrestrial life, as it suggests a purposeful mission from Mars to our planet. The Missing Thunderbird Photo In April 1890, an intriguing tale emerged from Arizona, recounting a remarkable encounter involving two cowboys and a colossal avian creature. According to the story, these brave individuals successfully vanquished a beastly creature reminiscent of a pterosaur, an ancient flying reptile known to have roamed the earth in prehistoric times. The creature in question boasted an awe-inspiring wingspan, smooth skin devoid of feathers, and bat-like wings, while its countenance bore a striking resemblance to that of an alligator. Fascinatingly, the cowboys purportedly transported the lifeless body of this extraordinary creature back to town, where it became an extraordinary spectacle its mighty wingspan stretching across the expanse of an entire barn, meticulously pinned for all to see. This enthralling account evokes images of a bygone era when mythical creatures and real-world wonders converged, leaving the residents and onlookers captivated by the mysterious creature. According to reports, it is possible that a photograph capturing this particular event was featured in the local newspaper known as the Tombstone Epitaph. Additionally, there is an existing narrative that details the unfolding of these events, specifically centered around the state of Texas. In the May 1963 edition of Saga magazine, a captivating account of the legendary Thunderbird, as well as several notable sightings of enormous avian creatures during the early 1960s, was shared by writer Jack Pearl. However, Pearl did not confine himself to merely narrating the tale. He took it a step further by asserting that the tombstone epitaph a newspaper dating back to 1886, had published an image depicting a colossal bird affixed to a wall. According to the newspaper, this gargantuan avian had been taken down by two adventurous prospectors and transported into town on a wagon. To provide a sense of scale, six fully grown men were positioned in front of the creature, their arms fully extended, with fingertip touching fingertip. Astonishingly, the wingtip-to-wingtip -wingtip measurement of this magnificent creature spanned a staggering approximately 36 feet. This comprehensive and in-depth retelling elevates the original text, delving into the rich details of the Thunderbird legend and the historical account published in the Tombstone Epitaph. By enriching the narration with additional information and examples, it offers a deeper understanding of the subject matter. While the current version of the story presents a variation in both the narrative and the physical characteristics of the creature, there appears to be a connection to the same incident. This prompts us to question whether this tale is nothing more than a legendary myth from the western region, or if there is some validity to the account at hand. 
In the September 1963 edition of Fate magazine, a publication renowned for exploring the supernatural and paranormal phenomena, an individual named H. M. Cranmer, writing as a correspondent, affirmed the authenticity of the story in question. What's more, Cranmer mentioned that the photograph, accompanying the story, had been widely circulated across numerous newspapers throughout the entire United States of America, garnering significant attention and intrigue. Cranmer's recollection of the photo was not unique, as renowned researcher Ivan T. Sanderson also had a vivid memory of encountering the same photo. In fact, Sanderson even claimed to have possessed a photocopy of the image at one point, which he had lent to two colleagues. Unfortunately, those associates misplaced the copy, adding to the intrigue surrounding the photo's whereabouts. Interestingly, the editorial team at Fate magazine speculated that they might have previously published the photo in an earlier issue. However, despite conducting a thorough search through their archives, they were unable to locate it. This puzzling situation contributes to the ongoing mystery and fascination surrounding the photo and its elusive existence. The initial epitaph narrative detailing the capture of a fascinating and extraordinary winged creature was originally published on April 26, 1890. However, it is important to note that this account made no mention of a photograph. The epitaph story resurfaced in a 1969 edition of Old West, creating further confusion about the authenticity of the alleged photograph associated with the incident. This re-emergence of the narrative only served to blur the line between fact and fiction, leaving us with lingering uncertainties about the true nature of the photograph. Interestingly enough, the publication of this article sparked a reader's recollection of another peculiar incident. In the summer of 1970, an individual reached out to the magazine and shared a first-hand narrative regarding a separate encounter with a flying creature near Tombstone. According to the writer, they had crossed paths with two cowboys who recounted a strikingly similar sighting around the year 1890. The cowboys claimed to have encountered this extraordinary bird-like creature, engaging in a pursuit that involved shooting at it and even chasing it until their horses refused to venture any further. Consequently, this colossal avian creature managed to evade capture, remained undocumented and was not brought back to town. It is worth noting that, apart from the difference in the outcome of the encounter, their accounts bear a remarkable resemblance to Bell's original report. The epitaph, however, stated that the photo did not exist, or if it did, it had not been in their newspaper. Responding to numerous inquiries, employees of the paper started a thorough search of back issues and files. They could find no such photo, and even an extended search of other Arizona and California newspapers of the period produced no results. A number of articles that appeared in Pursuit, the Journal for the Society for the Investigation of the Unexplained, prompted a memory from W. Ritchie Benedict, who recalled seeing Ivan T. Sanderson himself display a copy of the photo on a Canadian television show, The Pierre Benton Show. Unfortunately, though, no copies of the show have ever been found. During the 1990s, there was a widespread fascination surrounding the elusive Thunderbird photo among enthusiasts of the subject. The intensity of this obsession was such that it sparked an extensive and in-depth discussion that spanned several editions of Mark Chorvinsky's Strange magazine. Readers who claimed to have come across the fabled photo referred to various sources, including ancient books, Western photograph collections, magazines targeting men's interests, National Geographic, and more. In their relentless quest for evidence, individuals meticulously combed through countless volumes of True and Saga magazines, hoping to stumble upon the sought-after image. However, despite these efforts, their searches yielded nothing more than Jack Pearl's previous article, which had already been mentioned. This comprehensive exploration into the search for the Thunderbird photo not only highlights the widespread interest, but also underlines the meticulous nature of the investigations undertaken by enthusiasts across different sources and publications. During the late 1990s, John Keel, the acclaimed author of The Mothman Prophecies, adamantly asserted, I know I witnessed it, and not only that, I corroborated my experiences with numerous other individuals who also had the privilege of encountering this enigmatic entity. Keel firmly believed that he encountered it within the fascinating pages of men's magazines such as Saga or True, which enjoyed immense popularity during the 1960s. 
these publications delved into extraordinary topics including Bigfoot, specters, and other paranormal phenomena. Keel vividly recollected the iconic photograph that resonated with most observers, depicting men garbed in cowboy attire and the creature resembling a pterosaur or other prehistoric winged beast. Notably, Keel explicitly stated that the creature bore no resemblance to a vulture with its hooked beak, as explained by Sanderson. Instead, Keel described it as possessing a long and pointed beak akin to that of a pteranodon, a statement detailed in renowned works such as Jerome Clark's thought-provoking book, Unexplained. In the year 2000, a popular television program called Freaky Links revitalized the legendary Thunderbird photograph by staging a similar photo that captured widespread attention. The photograph depicted a lifeless pterosaur lying in a vast field, its impressive wings majestically spread. Surrounding the prehistoric creature, seven men clad in Civil War-era attire held rifles, evoking a sense of historical intrigue. Notably, one of the men was positioned at the forefront, confidently placing his foot atop the mythical creature. This captivating image, created as a prop by Fox TV and Universal Studios, has since found its home at the esteemed International Cryptozoology Museum, where it continues to fascinate enthusiasts of hidden animal species. In addition to the numerous illustrations, there has been a surge in the appearance of photographs showcasing deceased colossal winged reptiles alongside humans, which do not seem to be connected to either the freaky links or the montage image. These images have been circulating widely on the internet. While it is plausible that these photos are modern recreations, the exact source of many of them remains uncertain. This phenomenon has sparked intrigue and speculation among researchers and internet users alike, prompting further investigation into their origins and authenticity. The Mystery of Bell Star Bell Star, a prominent figure in the 1870s and 1880s, garnered the nickname Bandit Queen due to her notorious involvement in horse theft and highway robbery, primarily across the vast expanses of Oklahoma. This audacious outlaw not only made a name for herself in the criminal underworld, but also formed romantic relationships with a string of male bandits, further adding to her intriguing persona. The list of her paramours includes the infamous Jim Reed, Cole Younger, Jim July, and Sam Starr, whose surname she adopted, etching it into the annals of history. Belle Starr's gripping and tempestuous existence captivated the imagination of many during her time. Throughout her life, Belle engaged in numerous criminal activities, which resulted in multiple incarcerations. Surprisingly, she managed to elude law enforcement for a significant portion of her existence. Even while fulfilling the responsibilities of motherhood, Belle remained committed to her outlaw lifestyle. Undeterred by societal gender norms, she pursued her unlawful endeavors with a single-minded pursuit of wealth and riches. However, her criminal escapades came to a sudden halt on February 3, 1889, when an unidentified assailant ended her life in a small town in Oklahoma, leaving behind a trail of potential suspects. Bell's criminal repertoire included horse theft, wagon train robberies, and holdups of general stores across Oklahoma, North Texas, and Arkansas. The end of her life brought an end to a chapter filled with audacious criminal exploits that had captured the attention of many. There were numerous individuals who could potentially hold animosity towards her. Nonetheless, one person, in particular, stood out among the rest, Jim July, Bell's former lover. Historians later described July as being particularly stormy, alluding to his turbulent nature. His relationship with Bell was no exception, marked by constant quarrels and even continued animosity after their separation. The situation escalated to the point where July allegedly offered monetary compensation to someone in exchange for ending the life of his unpleasant ex-partner. On the day Bell met her demise, she was supposed to accompany July to Fort Smith, Arkansas, to face charges of horse stealing. Both of them were expected to surrender themselves to the authorities. However, something unexpected occurred during their journey. According to accounts, Bell, it is said, had a change of heart before reaching Fort Smith, indicating a reluctance to proceed with the supposed deal. However, tragedy struck when, on a desolate country road, devoid of any witnesses, she was taken out. While one newspaper report exaggeratedly claimed she was fired at an astonishing 60 times, this particular detail is highly unlikely. 
Some sources suggest that Belle managed to make her way back to a nearby farmhouse after being shot. Unfortunately, her injuries were grievous, and she succumbed to them shortly thereafter, unable to be saved. The passing of Star caused quite a stir in the region, attracting significant attention from the local community. She was renowned for her notorious and unpredictable behavior, which led to her making numerous adversaries, ranging from her neighbors to the sheriff of the town. As soon as the incident occurred, suspicions immediately fell on July as a potential culprit. However, later on, another individual named Watson, who had been engaged in a long-standing feud with Bell, came forward as a possible assailant. This prompted the sheriff to focus his attention on Watson and subsequently bring him to trial. Despite the charges pressed against him, Watson was ultimately acquitted due to lack of substantial evidence. Meanwhile, July never faced any formal legal proceedings. Unfortunately, the case of Starr remains unsolved. This farmer couldn't believe what he was seeing when he viewed his CCTV footage. As of right now, there's not much information to go by, and no news outlets picked up the story, which is odd because people can't seem to wrap their heads around what happened. Upon entering, his eyes widened in disbelief. There, amidst the hay and dust, lay a gaping hole in his barn roof. The wooden planks had splintered and shattered, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. The farmer began to panic as he surveyed the damage, wondering how such a catastrophe could have taken place. He rushed back to the house, clambering up the staircase to reach his office. The farmer had installed a security camera system on his property years ago, mainly to keep an eye on potential thieves. Now, those cameras might hold the key to unravelling the mystery of the damaged barn. He accessed the CCTV footage on his computer. He watched the playback, and what he saw left him utterly bewildered. In the dimly lit footage from the previous night, a bizarre sequence of events unfolded before him. One of his prized cows could be seen falling through the roof, with many saying that the cow was falling at speed and that it was like it had been dropped from a great height. As if guided by some unseen force, the cow suddenly shot through the roof, damaging the entire area. One farmer commented that in all of their years of owning a barn, they've never had a cow appear on top of it. Others questioned how such a large cow would be able to climb on top of the roof. It wasn't long before online users began to put forward their own theories for why the cow fell through the roof. The fascination with unidentified objects has endured for decades, captivating the imagination of people worldwide. While unidentified object sightings have been reported in various forms and locations. One of the more curious aspects of these encounters involves the mysterious interest in cattle. Throughout the history of sightings, a peculiar pattern has emerged. Cattle frequently feature in close encounters. Witnesses have reported a range of incidents involving unidentified objects and cattle. Reports of cattle found under mysterious circumstances often involve peculiar surgical precision with organs and body parts removed with apparent surgical expertise. These cases have raised questions about the motivations behind these actions. Witnesses have claimed to see mysterious objects hovering above pastures and cattle being lifted into the air or taken aboard the craft. Those who have seen the video suggested that the cow may have been taken by one of these objects and dropped through the roof. The claims sound outlandish, but for several decades, Farmers have reported seeing mysterious lights above their pastures. In some cases, unidentified object sightings have coincided with reports of cattle displaying unusual behavior, such as panic, agitation, or disorientation. Witnesses have noted that these changes in behavior seem to coincide with the presence of unidentified objects. Cattle expirations have been occurring for many years, with documented cases dating back as far as the late 19th century. However, it was during the 1970s that a noticeable increase in reported incidents occurred, primarily in the United States. In the years that followed this surge, regular reports of such expirations began to emerge from various corners of the globe, indicating a widespread phenomenon. These incidents, 
characterized by unexplained and precise dissections of cattle, have continued to perplex and intrigue researchers and investigators alike. Despite extensive research, we are no closer to understanding what causes these mysterious expirations. The occurrence of this phenomenon, although it has never completely disappeared from public attention, seemed to have diminished to some extent. However, over the past 25 years, the situation has taken a different turn. In fact, if anything, these events appear to be transpiring with increasing frequency. It is evident that they are becoming more prevalent and noteworthy. This trend, which has been observed in recent times, points towards a significant shift in the frequency and significance of these incidents. During the summer of 1990 in Vancouver, Canada, the residents found themselves caught in a series of inexplicable occurrences that lasted the entire season. Unusual sounds, reminiscent of machine-like noises, pervaded the skies across the region, perplexing the local inhabitants who were unaccustomed to such auditory phenomena. Adding to the enigma, a resident even recounted witnessing the presence of an unfamiliar figure in a nearby field. These forms of expirations are not restricted solely to the continent of North America. Moreover, researchers in the United Kingdom have conducted investigations that shed light on the potential perpetrators. The phenomenon spans beyond geographical boundaries and has captured the attention of experts worldwide. These experts have delved deep into their research aiming to uncover the underlying causes and individuals or entities responsible for these mysterious expirations. According to the Animal Pathology Field Unit, there is an overwhelming certainty that advanced beings are the culprits behind the incidents of animal expirations, particularly those that have persistently plagued the Welsh region. The Animal Pathology Field Unit has conducted extensive research and analysis leaving no room for doubt regarding the involvement of mysterious entities in these incidents. Wales, in particular, has experienced a significant increase in unidentified object activity, which directly corresponds to the surge in cases of animal expirations. The meticulous investigations conducted proved that many of these incidents could not have been done by humans. Investigator Phil Hoyle, a seasoned expert with years of experience in dealing with such cases, refutes the notion that these instances of animal expirations are linked to rituals. According to Hoyle, the level of precision and sophistication observed in these injuries indicates the potential involvement of advanced beings, the military, or perhaps even a combination of both. This suggests that there may be an underlying agenda or purpose behind these incidents. Over a span of six months, from 2011 to 2012, Numerous well-known show horses experienced acts similar to those seen in cattle. Instances of these incidents were reported from various locations across the United Kingdom, sparking a wide range of theories. Speculations ranged from sinister rituals to clandestine government experiments, leaving the public perplexed and searching for answers. In the city of Shrewsbury, approximately a year before the present time of this account in 2010, farmers encountered a rather perplexing phenomenon. They witnessed strange occurrences involving their livestock, especially sheep. According to their reports, peculiar entities or objects would suspend themselves in mid-air above the animals, emitting a laser beam downwards onto them. During a particularly active phase of these unusual explorations, numerous individuals claimed to have observed strange orange lights in the sky. Several theories and hypotheses have emerged to explain the UFO cattle connection though none have been definitively proven. These theories offer intriguing possibilities for why unidentified objects might theoretically be interested in cattle. Some speculate that advanced beings, if indeed behind these sightings, might be conducting biological experiments involving Earth's flora and fauna. Cattle, as a large and easily accessible terrestrial species, could be a subject of interest for such studies. Cattle have been subjected to extensive genetic modification and breeding by humans for centuries. UFO interest in cattle could relate to advanced civilizations' curiosity about our genetic experiments and breeding practices, leading them to study these domesticated animals. In hypothetical scenarios, where advanced beings are facing resource scarcity on their home planets, they might consider terrestrial species, including cattle, as potential sources of sustenance or materials. This theory, however, raises ethical and logistical questions about the logistics of such an endeavor. 
cattle grazing areas often cover vast expanses of land. Mysterious sightings near cattle ranches might be attributed to the extraterrestrial interest in monitoring environmental changes, possibly related to ecological concerns or Earth's shifting climate. Cattle hold significant cultural and symbolic value in many human societies. Mysterious sightings involving cattle might be part of extraterrestrial attempts at communication or interaction with our species, acknowledging the significance we attribute to these animals. Encounters involving cattle could serve a psychological purpose, potentially aimed at studying human reactions, belief systems, or societal responses to unusual events. This theory suggests that cattle serve as a proxy for human subjects in experiments. It is essential to approach the unidentified object and cattle connection with scientific skepticism and acknowledge that the evidence supporting these theories is largely anecdotal and circumstantial. Many sightings involving cattle lack definitive proof or concrete scientific data to establish causality or correlation. Although the most popular stories surrounding advanced phenomena tend to focus on the topics of sightings of mysterious crafts or supernatural occurrences featuring humanoid creatures, many researchers often forget that some of the strongest pieces of evidence of intervention appears to center around the disappearances of cattle and subsequent damages to livestock. The earliest known written record of bizarre animal surgeries and sudden disappearances of a large number of livestock comes from an official document dated sometime during the early 1600s when an investigator for the court of James I of England claimed that impossible to explain mass expirations of sheep were being recorded all across London and nearby shires. It was originally believed that the sudden expirations of the sheep could have been caused by neighbouring farms competing in market production alongside hungry travellers that were committing theft as they travelled throughout London, of which was the most heavily populated region during the 1600s. However, when the investigations took place, evidence was found that seemed to reject the original hypothesis. According to the court investigator, the sheep were found to have expired through causes that were otherwise impossible to attribute to human activity. Their organs, meat and fleece remained untouched, with only evidence of possible tallow removal, and blood having been completely drained from the animal with no spillage. Even more difficult to explain was the sheer number of sheep that suddenly expired in what farmers believed would have been over the course of only a few hours. The investigator wrote that in some cases there were more than a hundred sheep that suddenly expired and no evidence of footprints or tracks that could point towards a group of people having perpetrated the crime. When the investigator asked around local regions that were at the epicenter of the series of sheep disappearances and expirations, many attributed the sight of brilliant fireworks nearby to have been the possible cause. Some believed that the fireworks could have scared the sheep and caused them to pass away in fright, whereas others believed that the lights they had seen in the sky could have had a more sinister purpose. The court ended the investigation by saying that around the city of London and some of the shires adjoining, whole expirations of sheep have been made, in some places the number reaching as high as 100. The phenomenon would continue for several decades before ending entirely. The most interesting aspect of these sheep disappearances seem to bear remarkable resemblance to modern-day cattle disappearances and possible advanced intervention. When researching mass livestock expirations, it became obvious that cattle disappearances and surgeries are a fairly recent development with the first recorded instances beginning during the 1800s to modern day. Many believe that the sudden change of livestock being targeted, from sheep to now cattle, appears to match directly with the world market and primary source of meat production during these times. When sheep disappearances, surgeries and unexplained expirations were occurring en masse, the main meat export around the world centered around sheep populations. It's only been over the last couple of centuries that the role of cattle has slowly changed for the purpose of meat consumption. During the 1600 and late 1700s, when recorded instances of sheep expirations were occurring, cattle were predominantly used for labor and secondarily used for milk production. Anonymous is a loosely associated international network of activists and hackers known for their online operations and digital activism. Since its emergence in the early 2000s, Anonymous has captured the attention of the media and the public, often making headlines with their high-profile cyber attacks 
and involvement in various social and political causes. Anonymous operates under the philosophy of hacktivism, combining hacking skills with social and political activism. Their actions are often aimed at exposing perceived injustices, promoting freedom of speech, and challenging systems of power. One of their most well-known tactics is distributed denial-of-service attacks, where they overwhelm a target website's servers with traffic, temporarily rendering it inaccessible. While Anonymous is known for their disruptive activities, they also advocate for online privacy and freedom of expression. They have been involved in campaigns against internet censorship, government surveillance, and corporate greed. In the last few days, hacking groups such as Anonymous Sudan have issued a threat to carry out a potentially devastating attack on the European financial system. Their primary target will be the SWIFT International Communication System, and various members have come forward and said that these attacks could have wide-ranging consequences. A video was recently published where the group states that they are retaliating against Europe for its involvement in recent conflicts. According to security experts, although this possibility may seem unlikely, financial institutions should remain vigilant for potential attacks, as some of these groups who are sending these threats have a reputation for launching potent distributed denial-of-service attacks. Anonymous Sudan, a branch of the larger anonymous hacktivist group, issued a video and multiple messages on Telegram, cautioning about an upcoming destructive attack directed towards the European banking system. The post also suggested the possibility of targeting the US Federal Reserve. The person featured in the video adopts the expected anonymous approach, wearing a Guy Fawkes mask and disguising their voice. They suggest that the banking system holds significant influence. The issue with the group is that not everyone has to agree on the motives, as anyone can join Anonymous, and for this reason in recent years it has become known for engaging in this kind of political manoeuvring, which is consistent with their previous actions of issuing threats to other organizations. The video provides an overview of an upcoming attack, highlighting the knowledge and skills of the group in relation to the European banking system. One of the most notable incidents associated with Anonymous was the Operation Payback campaign in 2010. This campaign targeted organizations that were perceived as threats to internet freedom, such as the Motion Picture Association of America and the Recording Industry Association of America. Through distributed denial-of-service attacks and other methods, Anonymous disrupted the online presence of these organizations as a form of protest against their perceived infringement on digital rights. Another significant event was the 2011 collaboration between Anonymous and WikiLeaks. Anonymous launched Operation Avenge Assange in response to the arrest of Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks. They targeted various websites, including those of payment service providers and government agencies, in retaliation for their actions against Assange. This collaboration highlighted the power of decentralized activism and the ability of Anonymous to mobilize its global network of supporters. However, the decentralized nature of Anonymous also means that anyone can claim affiliation and carry out actions in the name of the collective. This has led to controversy and internal debates within the group regarding the legitimacy of certain operations. Some argue that it dilutes the group's message and allows for malicious actors to exploit the Anonymous brand for personal gain or nefarious purposes. In recent years, Anonymous has continued to make headlines with their involvement in various causes, such as the global protest movements like Occupy Wall Street. They have also targeted extremist groups, exposing their online activities and identities. Through their actions, Anonymous has demonstrated the potential of online collective action in effecting change and holding powerful entities accountable. As of right now, the group has made themselves a prominent and influential collective of activists and hackers who have made a significant impact on the digital landscape. They have challenged authority, exposed corruption, and promoted online freedom of expression. While their actions have sometimes been controversial and their methods debated, there is no denying the role they have played in shaping online activism and bringing attention to social and political issues. Some members of Anonymous have been critical of current events happening in the world right now, leading to certain accounts being banned. The hacking group Anonymous has been a subject of debate and controversy due to their activities and methods. Whether they are perceived as good or bad largely depends on one's perspective and the specific actions being considered. 
One of the main arguments in favor of Anonymous is their role as digital activists and whistleblowers. They have been involved in exposing corruption, advocating for online privacy and freedom of expression, and challenging oppressive systems. Their actions have shed light on issues that may have otherwise remained hidden, sparking important conversations and promoting transparency. Anonymous has played a significant role in amplifying the voices of marginalized communities and shedding light on social and political injustices. Moreover, Anonymous has used its skills to target and disrupt organizations and individuals that are perceived as oppressive or engaged in unethical practices. They have targeted entities such as oppressive governments, hate groups, and corporations involved in shady activities. In some cases, they have successfully disrupted the operations of these organizations, forcing them to reconsider their actions. Supporters argue that such interventions serve as a form of direct action against those who abuse their power and harm others. Additionally, Anonymous has been credited with promoting online activism and the idea that anyone can make a difference. By operating in a decentralized manner, they have empowered individuals to stand up against injustice and express dissent. They have inspired others to take action and have raised awareness about the importance of digital rights and freedoms. In this regard, Anonymous is seen as a catalyst for change, sparking conversations and mobilizing people to take a stand. On the other hand, critics argue that Anonymous's actions often involve illegal activities and violate the principles of law and order. Their use of hacking techniques such as distributed denial-of-service attacks, can disrupt legitimate services and cause harm to innocent individuals. This raises concerns about the ethics of their methods and the potential collateral damage they may cause. Furthermore, the lack of accountability opens the door for malicious actors to exploit the anonymous brand for personal gain or to pursue their own agendas. Critics argue that this undermines the credibility and legitimacy of the collective making it difficult to discern between genuine activism and malicious intent. There are also concerns about the potential for indiscriminate targeting and collateral damage. While Anonymous may have noble intentions, their actions can inadvertently harm innocent individuals or organizations that are unrelated to the issues they are addressing. The lack of centralized control and oversight within the group makes it difficult to ensure that their actions are targeted and proportional. As of right now, the assessment of whether Anonymous is good or bad is subjective and depends on one's perspective. Supporters argue that their actions serve as a means to expose corruption, promote transparency and advocate for online freedom. They view Anonymous as a force for change and as champions of digital activism. Critics, on the other hand, raise concerns about the legality of their actions, potential collateral damage and the lack of accountability within the group. It is important to critically examine the motivations, methods, and impact of Anonymous to form an informed opinion about their activities and their role in the digital landscape. Cybersecurity and cybercrime have become significant issues in today's digital age with numerous financial and societal implications. The financial costs associated with cybersecurity measures and the economic impact of cybercrime are substantial. To begin, it is important to understand that the field of cybersecurity encompasses various aspects, including technology, personnel, infrastructure, and policy. Organizations and governments around the world allocate significant resources to protect their digital assets and infrastructure from cyber threats. According to various reports, the global spending on cybersecurity has been steadily increasing in recent years. In 2020, the global expenditure on cybersecurity was estimated to be around $145 billion. This figure includes investments made by both public and private sectors, covering areas such as network security, endpoint protection, data encryption, threat intelligence, and incident response. It is worth noting that this estimate does not capture the full extent of cybersecurity investments, as many organizations also allocate significant internal resources to develop and maintain their cybersecurity capabilities. However, while cybersecurity expenditures are substantial, the costs of cybercrime continue to rise and pose a significant financial burden. Cybercrime involves various illicit activities conducted through digital means, such as hacking, data breaches, identity theft, financial fraud, and ransomware attacks. The financial losses resulting from cybercrime are staggering, impacting both businesses and individuals. 
Estimating the precise costs of cybercrime is challenging due to underreporting, varying methodologies, and the evolving nature of cyber threats. However, studies and reports provide valuable insights into the magnitude of the problem. According to one estimate, the global cost of cybercrime in 2020 reached $1 trillion. This figure includes direct financial losses, such as stolen funds and monetary damages, as well as indirect costs, such as recovery efforts, reputation damage, and productivity losses. It is important to highlight that the costs associated with cybercrime extend beyond immediate financial losses. Cyber attacks can have long-lasting consequences on businesses and individuals, including legal implications, regulatory penalties, and loss of customer trust. Moreover, cybercrime can disrupt critical infrastructure, impact national security, and undermine economic stability. To counter the growing threat of cybercrime, governments, organizations, and individuals are investing significant resources in cybersecurity measures. The goal is to develop robust defenses, enhance incident response capabilities, and promote cybersecurity awareness and education. Governments around the world are allocating budgets to strengthen their cybersecurity infrastructure and establish frameworks and regulations to combat cyber threats. In addition to government investments, organizations are dedicating substantial resources to safeguard their systems and protect sensitive data. This includes investments in advanced security technologies, employee training programs, security audits, and collaborations with cybersecurity firms. The private sector, including industries such as finance, healthcare, and technology, plays a crucial role in driving cybersecurity innovation and best practices. While the billions of dollars spent on cybersecurity demonstrate the commitment to protect digital assets, it is essential to recognize that cybersecurity is an ongoing battle. Cyber threats continue to evolve and become more sophisticated, necessitating continual investments and advancements in cybersecurity measures. Moreover, the costs of cybercrime are expected to rise as criminals adapt to new technologies and exploit vulnerabilities. Ring of Fire Activity Sparks Earthquake Fears There are some places on our planet that are, unfortunately, more prone to disaster than others. Perhaps the most dangerous of all these places has earned itself the nickname the Ring of Fire, as a result of its renowned reputation. This is a path along the Pacific Ocean that is particularly prone to natural disasters. Along this so-called Ring of Fire is a host of active volcanoes, and the alignment of the tectonic plates means that this ring sees the majority of the earthquakes on Earth too. In 2018, researchers began to pick up on a number of earthquakes affecting areas nearby to this geological terror zone, namely Japan, Guam, and Taiwan. However, research conducted in California, which has also seen its fair share of natural disasters, suggests that there may be aftershocks that continue to affect the area, due to the tremors seemingly coming in multiples. What is even more concerning is the belief that this smaller seismic activity has the capability to be building to something significantly larger. This Californian study took a sample of 101 major earthquakes recorded in the area surrounding the Pacific Ring of Fire over a 26-year period, from 1990 to 2016. The research was published in the scientific journal Science Advances and provided some insight in the impact of aftershock activity following earthquakes. Earthquakes are most often caused when tectonic plates meet one another. The movement becomes too great and then the excess energy is released as a shockwave, in turn causing the earthquake. We have long been acting upon the assumption, despite there being statistical inconsistencies when we have looked at relevant seismic data, that an area in that has recently seen a slip in the tectonic plates is more likely to experience a second slip soon after, meaning multiple earthquakes are somewhat likely to occur in the same area within a reasonable amount of time to one another. The reality seems to be a little more complex. As opposed to the residual stress on the fault line, the fracture along which the initial slip first occurred, the ongoing impact is on the surrounding areas, which, with each nearby earthquake, are being pushed increasingly closer to failure themselves. This is what results in aftershocks, adjacent ruptures, and the clustered nature in which earthquakes, 
tend to occur. This pattern has been observed in Taiwan, Guam, and Japan. Whilst they are far from one another in relation to static stress interactions, the seismic shaking has had an ongoing impact, eventually reaching each of these impacted areas. Prior to this analysis, a lot of our understanding, even the elements of which were deemed to be correct, were highly speculative. The ongoing research seems to suggest that the most likely predictor for the location of the next earthquake is the surrounding area, because of the initial shock. We are yet to develop a technology that can inform us how big this will be. So while we can be weary, we are yet to know if this may be an indicator of a significant threat or a slight continuation. It's very much ongoing research. The technology that is being developed here has the potential to save lives, giving much greater evacuation time in the event of disasters. Man discovers mysterious large face on Canada cliffside. Sometimes the answers to mysteries seem to be right in front of us. For over two years, Hank Gus, of an Aboriginal group called the Sheshat First Nation, had been searching for a face that he heard existed on a cliffside on Reeks Island. When he finally discovered that he and Parks Canada First Nations program manager Matthew Payne shared the news with an archaeologist they work with in the area. Describing the face, Payne stated, We went out to see it recently, and it's remarkable. It really is a face staring back at you. The Seshat have lived in the area for thousands of years, and one goal is to find out if the face goes along with any oral histories the Sheshat have. Another question archaeologists would like to answer is if the face is man-made or a natural creation. A barrier to discovering more about the face, which is believed to be about seven feet tall, is that the cliff where it resides is very dangerous. The island has a rocky shoreline with lots of hidden rocks, and it can be dangerous depending on sea conditions, commented Payne. You need to know what you're doing to go and look at it. Despite these barriers, the Seshat First Nation and Parks Canada are eager to look at the face close up. Whether or not the face is man-made or created by Mother Nature, it's reported to be quite striking. The fact that it has been witnessed by so few to date is rather incredible and shows how new discoveries can pop up just about anywhere. Huge chimpanzee population thriving in remote Congo forest The Congo forest is known as one of the most treacherous places on earth. Despite the dangers lurking in this colossal forest, the local chimpanzee populace is seemingly flourishing with life. The Congo forests border the Central African Republic. Legends of old claimed the existence of colossal apes that howled at the full moon and devoured lions and predators, but these were believed to be merely myths. After a team of researchers wandered through the forest's unlisted lands, they discovered what is thought to be a chimp megaculture, possibly the last of its kind, with a huge population of chimps. German primatologist Cleve Hicks states, this is one of the few places left on Earth with a huge continuous population of chimps. We estimate many thousands of individuals, perhaps tens of thousands. This would make the chimp populace the largest in Africa. Because the land was uncharted, we have insight into how chimps and apes act in completely natural environments removed from any prior human interruption. The chimps in the Biliuli forest are larger than most other chimps, meaning the legends have seeds of truth in them and they have, in fact, been spotted devouring leopards. In the colonies of the forest, male chimps patrol the area while mothers teach their young to utilize tools and eat insects, and there is a definite order and way of living for these chimpanzees. The cameras the researchers placed around the forest showed that aside from the chimps, there are olive baboons, hyenas, and forest elephants all residing in the area, and so much more wildlife. According to Hicks, we saw incredible amounts of wildlife on our camera traps, but we did not catch a single film of a human. It remains one of the last untouched wildernesses in Africa. The Billy chimpanzees were first found in 2008, but the research did not occur until recently with the published study in the Journal of Biological Conservation. As it stands, in Africa, humans alone have destroyed chimpanzee habitats so badly 
that in just the past century, their population has gone from millions to several hundred thousand, which emphasizes the importance of this discovery. However, researcher John Hart claims the area is at great risk of being opened up and explains that the Lord's Resistance Army are trying to move through the part of the forest and brigands from the area are trying to create conflict bases in the Congo forest that will endanger the animals. Scientists and researchers worry about hunters seeking to invade this previous unfounded section of the Biliuli to hunt the chimps and elephants to trade in the Congo Basin. Around 440 chimps are eradicated annually for trade. Hart says, with the availability of bushmeat declining elsewhere, commercial bushmeat hunters are going further and further into the forest. DRC law protects chimpanzees due to their endangered status. However, the law is only applicable if hunters get caught. Officials can be bribed, and according to Hicks, that is often the case, since the local militia benefit at times from these huntings. Hicks believes the military is even giving weapons to the poachers. The chimp megaculture is helpless to poachers should they decide to invade the area and hunt the animals with no proper or solid protection. Elephants, especially, have already been severe victims of poaching and they, along with chimps, cannot stand to suffer an even larger population loss. Hart desires for there to be a unit of wildlife guards who circle the forest and protect the animals inside in order to stop the hunters. According to Hart, it is a very significant opportunity to preserve a whole ecosystem of chimpanzees. Elsewhere on this continent, this opportunity just does not exist. But what do you make of these recent discoveries? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.